Chapter 25 Asher I wait until Dee leaves before stomping over to the door and turning all the locks. I'm giving myself a second to calm down before I go talk to Chelsea. Coming in to hear Dee trying to tell Chelsea that I'm doubting our relationship? Second fucking guessing? Jesus Christ. Just thinking about hearing her talking that shit makes me want to hurt someone. It's a good thing she left because I was about two seconds away from blowing my fuse. Never did I think that Chelsea would think that, but hearing that garbage, and for just a second letting myself believe that Chelsea could for a second believe it, is making my blood boil. You know I don't believe her, right? She says, coming up behind me and resting her forehead against my back, moving her arms slowly, and fucking hesitantly, around my waist. Hell, fucking no. It kills me that there's even a shadow of a doubt in us right now. And I did this to her. I grasp her wrists and pull her hands around me tightly, lacing our fingers together and letting my chin drop to my chest. With just her touch, the anger I was feeling towards Dee and her verbal vomit evaporates. I'm exhausted, worried, and fuck me, scared. Scared for Chelsea and scared for our boy. Now, on top of that, I'm scared that she doubts my commitment to her. Fuck me, there is no way I'm going to let that happen. Hold on, sunshine, let me grab something, okay? She takes a step back, my body instantly missing the feel of her against me. Turning sharply, I prowl through the house, a man on a mission, and grab the one thing that's been burning a hole in my pocket for the last three weeks, the one thing that I know will end all of this doubt she's feeling. I know the timing isn't ideal. But we've done everything else in some weird, convoluted web of twisted, ass-backwards, unconventional, and hell. There's no reason that we shouldn't keep some sort of a trend going. When I come back into the living room, I find her gazing out the balcony door. There isn't much other than trees to look at, so I know she's just lost in thought. I take a deep breath and walk over to her. Sunshine, do you love me? Well, Asher, your great fucking lead in there, dumbass. She tilts her head, her lips just barely tipping up. Of course I love you, you silly man. That shit with D? Do you think that I would be with you out of obligation? Think hard about that, Chelsea. You know my past with females, and you know how hard it was for me to trust. There is nothing that would make me doubt your reasons for being here, baby, she whispers. You know that I love you. You're my light, sunshine. You're my reason for everything that I do. You're my person, I say, parroting her earlier words. Her eyes widen and tears start to fill them. Damn, I need to hurry this up before she loses it. Right, I look down, fiddling with the words I need to say. I look up, and before I can speak, she launches herself at me. I quickly move my hips back so that her stomach doesn't take the impact. She's gotten bigger in the last two weeks, and I mentally kick myself for not being here, for missing just a second of it. With my hips pulled back from her body, her lips are just a short distance from my neck. She lifts up, coming up as far as she can on her toes, and gives me a soft kiss against my neck. I go to straighten, but she tightens her hold on my neck. I feel her warm breath against my ear before her tongue darts out to trace the shell. Then, after the jolt passes through my body, she whispers softly, Yes. I pull back, confused as hell about where this conversation just went. Yes? Yes, baby, it would have been a lot easier if you would have let me buy a ring and get down on my knee to ask, but hey, what's one more thing we do our own way? That's just one of the things I love about you, Asher James Cooper. You march to the beat of your own drum. Well, I'll be damned. Did you just propose to me, woman? I try to scowl, but she just smiles brighter. That damn light that erases my darkness is shining so bright that I'm convinced that in this moment she's wholly chased all of my demons from the past away. The grin that takes over my face is so large that I can feel my cheeks burning. Damn, I'm one lucky man. Uh, baby, I did not propose to you. I answered your stuttering attempt at one to me. Just beat you to the punch, she giggles, and that sound shoots straight through me. My heart feels like it's so full it could burst. Do I at least get to see my ring? 
Come here, you beautifully perfect, smart-ass woman of mine. Let me do this right. She swiftly closes the distance between us, almost tripping over her feet in order to do so. I take a deep breath, not for courage, but because I can smell her delectable scent. Closing my eyes and picturing her beautiful face makes no sense, since the real thing is right in front of me. Opening my eyes, I lean forward and give her a soft kiss. Her eyes start to water when I fold myself down to one knee and reach up to frame her stomach, giving our boy a nuzzle with my nose, a quick I love you, and kiss. I grab one of her hands, the left one, pull the ring out of my pocket and place it on her finger. Chelsea Nicole Avery, the day you walked into my life I knew I would forever crave your light. You've taught me so much. I don't look for the bad in everyone anymore. I see beauty in everything around me. I look forward to waking up with you pushed close to my body and my hand resting on our son. You've given me back a life I didn't know I was close to losing. A second chance that I needed to be the man you believe I am. Every day I wake up and want to do everything I can to prove to you that I am that man. You're my everything, sunshine. You've made me whole again. I lean forward and kiss her finger that has my ring shining bright. Just like her, its light reminds me once again how much this woman means to me. I love you, Chelsea, and it would make me the happiest man on earth if you would marry me. Be my person for the rest of our lives. Her smile hasn't slipped, and for once, I don't even bother trying to stop the tears. I can feel some of my own starting to burn at the back of my throat. Yes, God, yes, she sobs. I love you so much, baby. I shiver when she calls me that. Every single time, it's like a drug for me. She calls me baby, and I want to drop to my knees and offer her the world. I love you too, Sunshine. Chapter 26 Chelsea Asher just left the bed to grab me some water. My throat is burning, in a good way, from screaming his name so many times. He didn't waste a second. I said yes, and the next thing I knew, I was in his arms while he charged through the apartment. A man on a mission. He took me hard the first time, both of us needing it. The second time was slow and sweet, and if you asked me, I would swear the earth moved. We still need to talk, but right now, with my heart this full, I couldn't stop smiling if I tried. What's that smile all about? He inquires from the side of the bed. I roll my head and take in every fine as hell inch of his tan skin. His muscles are bulging, and a fine sheen of sweat covers his body. His cock is still semi-erect, and I smirk wickedly when I see him start to swell under my gaze. You're so damn fine, I sigh. He laughs, hands me the water, and walks over to the bathroom. I admire his backside as he walks, each firm glow flexing as he strolls lazily. Damn, I hiss. He turns and gives me a sinful smirk before stepping into the bathroom and out of my line of sight. I take a deep pull of the ice-cold water he brought me before setting it down on the nightstand. Lean back and spread him, he rumbles when he walks back up to the side of the bed. I gape at him for a second. Then he holds up the washcloth in his hands with a wink. Someone sure is thinking some naughty thoughts. You need a spanking, sunshine? Have you been a bad girl? My pussy convulses at his words. He spanked me a few times when things got rough, and each time I came harder than the last. Damn, I love this man. I lean back, making a slow show of spreading my legs. I might be pregnant, but last time I checked, my arms still work, baby. I think I'm capable of cleaning my own body. And you would deny me this? Baby, seeing my cum falling out of your tight cunt is probably one of the hottest things I've seen. I'm inside you, and my cum is marking your body as mine. There isn't anything more arousing. Well, maybe there is, but this... Fuck. You have no idea. After he finishes wiping every inch of my pussy, my legs are quivering with the strength of holding back my orgasm. How embarrassing is it that I'm seconds away from exploding and all he's doing is wiping me off? He looks up from where his head has been leaning in while he was cleaning me off, noticing the heat in my eyes and I'm sure the blush that covers my skin. His eyebrow cocks and that lethal grin takes over his lips. Without breaking eye contact... 
He leans forward and gives me one long lick of his warm tongue. Lifting up, I'm confused for a breath of a second, and then I feel his hand pop down on my pussy. His fingers hit with just enough pressure against my swollen nerves that I throw my head back and scream. My eyes roll back in my head, my toes curl, and I gasp with the power of this orgasm. My whole body is blazing white hot. Oh, God! Oh, my God! Holy Jesus! I scream again, another wave of pure bliss crashing over me when he dips two thick fingers in deep. I feel like I'm being tugged under in some riptide of pleasure, and it's almost too much for me to bear. That's it, sunshine. That's it. He coos in my ear as I ride the wave, helpless to do anything but hold on to him tight. Fuck, the way you milk my fingers makes me so hard. I feel his weight shift, and just when I think I'm coming down from the second wave, he's pushing his thick cock in deep and prolonging my orgasm. He's leaning up on his knees, careful to keep his weight off my stomach and pushing in quick bursts. It doesn't take long before I'm barreling over yet another wave, or hell, maybe I've been riding the same one in some funnel of pleasure that my body doesn't know how to escape from, and doesn't want to. It doesn't take long, despite the fact that, in the last few hours, he's already come twice. He pushes in deep and rolls his hips. His face is a picture of ecstasy as he empties himself inside me again. I always used to read the books where the hero would come and come and come and then come again. I'd roll my eyes, thinking that surely there was no way a man like that with stamina of a god exists. Tonight, Asher proved me wrong. Those men definitely do exist. And he's all mine. I can feel myself getting tired, but I know I can't go to sleep until Asher and I have talked. I don't feel right with this entire unknown ticking time bomb sitting between us. I need to know where he's coming from, where his head is, and what his plans are. He comes back from dropping another used washcloth in the dirty laundry hamper and climbs in behind me, curling his arm around my body and pulling me close. His palm instantly goes to my stomach and caresses the tight skin. I can feel our sun rolling around, and I smile when I feel Asher laugh against my back. We need to talk, baby, I start. He sighs. I know. Do you want to start? Maybe let me in and tell me what's kept you gone for the last two weeks? I'm not going to even lie, Ash. It killed me to think that I wasn't enough for you to let in and let help. I'm not going to crumble. I'm here to walk this road with you, remember? Sunshine, I saw your distress. I saw how much that letter shook you, and it killed me that something I'm doing could be the cause of your fear. I turn, rolling onto my other side and grabbing his hand to hold it between both of mine. I admire how strong his long fingers are, just like he is. Of course I was afraid, Asher. That's the normal reaction that anyone would feel if they were in the same position. That didn't mean that I needed you to protect me from knowing what was happening. I want to be that person you confide in. I want to help you, Asher. You know I never stopped looking into Dominic, right? I nod my head. I do in fact know how much he's researched his target. I helped him for months, compiling everything we could find on that scumbag. Yeah, I didn't think you stopped. I had hoped, but I think deep down I knew you hadn't given up. He closes his eyes tight, moving his forehead in that way he does that's resting against mine. His harsh breathing is dancing with each one of my calm breaths. I have enough intel on him now that it wouldn't take much for me to end this tomorrow. I know where he is in almost every second thanks to a tracking device I was able to slip under his car. When he leaves his compound, I know. I've been following his every move for the last eight days. His admission shocks me to the core. He's been putting himself in danger— recklessly kicking his thirst for vengeance into overdrive because of one stupid letter. Oh, baby, no, I plead, shaking my head rapidly against his. I have to, Chelsea. I don't know any other way to explain it. I feel like if I don't take care of him, that coop will never rest in peace. Oh, you silly, silly man. He draws back as if I've slapped him. I quickly finish before he gets the wrong impression. Your brother knew exactly what he was doing that day. I might not have seen it happen with my own eyes, but I know what kind of man he was, what kind of man you taught him to be, 
well enough to know that he didn't act without weighing all his options. It was a grim situation at any angle you look at it. I take a deep breath and let go of his hand, so that I can hold his face framed in my palms. I need to be able to look him in the eyes when I say this. He needs to see the truth within my own. Don't you see it, Ash? You're the one who taught him to be the man he was. You gave him every single tool he needed in order to become that man. He stepped in front of that bullet because he was brave and selfless. He did it so that he could save someone else, knowing damn well that if something went wrong, he was sacrificing his own life. You can't keep beating yourself up because you weren't there to protect him. I see you, baby. I know you think this misguided quest of vengeance is what Coop would want. But if you really believe that, really believe in your heart that he wanted that— I pause to collect my thoughts when I see his eyes flash. If you really believe that baby, then you didn't know him at all. His body is strung so tight right now that I know this is impossibly hard for him to hear, but I need him to hear it. I need him to hear it, and I pray that he understands. This quest to right a wrong, the vengeance that you're seeking, he wouldn't want that. You have to start living your life for the future that you're alive for, not the past that you're willing to die for. His eyes close slowly, one lone tear falling down his face, and I quickly sweep it away with my thumb. I'm so close, sunshine. I'm so close to ending it all. So close to ending this pain. I don't know if I can stop. His hushed words break my heart. I ache for him. You can, baby. You know you can. Talk to me. Why do you think that ending this monster's life would be worse than turning all of your evidence over to the right channels and making sure that he really pays? Don't you think a life behind bars is far worse than a quick death? You really need to think about that, Asher. Because by you being willing to continue down this path means that you're willing to put everything we've been building in jeopardy. If something goes wrong, you could be the one who ends up behind bars. Or worse, you could end up dead. And I'm telling you right now, I don't think I would survive that loss. I don't want to have to explain to little Zack why his daddy isn't here. It's taking every ounce of control that I possess not to break down right now. I keep my voice steady and my words strong, knowing that if I break down, he might not hear a word I say. Zack, he questions with a furrow of his thick brows. Our son, Asher. Zachariah Asher Cooper. But I've been calling him Zack for short. I give him a small smile and watch in fascination as a million emotions filter through his mind on his face. My big, strong man is falling apart, and I do the only thing I know to do— I pull him closer and drop my forehead to his. I rub his back as he gasps rapidly, trying to calm the war of emotions inside him down. He doesn't speak. He does his best at keeping it locked tight, but a few broken sobs break through his lips. I bite the inside of my cheek to keep from crying with him. I just run my fingers through his hair and down his back, holding him tight within my arms, giving him back the strength he's been giving me since the day I met him. After a long time of heavy breathing and a few more sobs, I hear him clear his throat. He doesn't look up, but I know he's about to address me, so I mentally hold on in preparation for what is to come. I'll talk to the guys tomorrow. I'll give them all the intel I have, and together we will decide what the best course is. I'm not giving you any promises, Sunshine, but I will see what they think, and if they agree with you, then I'll call a good friend of mine with the DEA and give them everything. For Coop and for you, and Zack, for all of us. I'll make sure that I do the right thing, he sighs. I want you to be there with me so that you know everything that's going on, okay? I let out the breath I didn't realize I was holding, feeling lighter than I have in weeks. I wrap my arms around him and bury my face in his neck. His arms come around me and we hold each other, soaking up the love we have and the knowledge that— from now on, no questions. We're in this together. Chapter 27 Asher Damn, it's been one crazy week. I've been running after the same skip, three different states. And finally, I've caught up to the slimy bastard. Of all the places I have to end the chase, it has to be a strip club. 
After almost starting a brawl in the club, I finally managed to secure the bastard and make my long drive home. Almost twelve hours later, with the afternoon sun blazing high in the sky, I feel like my body is literally dragging on the ground. I just want to get back to my apartment and crash. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if I sleep for a week straight. The first thing I do when I climb my tired ass up the old stairs to my one-bedroom rent-by-the-week apartment is pull out my phone and call Coop. It's been almost two weeks since we talked last, and I hate going that long without checking on him. Ash! He bellows through the line, making me wince. Damn migraine. Hey, brother, how's it going? Ah, uh, you know, same shit, different day. We've got some kind of crazy going down here. I'm starting to think it wouldn't feel normal if things weren't falling to shit. He laughs. Leave it to Coop to find something in any situation to laugh about. You never would have guessed that he was the same kid who used to cower meekly in the corner. Damn, I'm so proud of the man he's become. Yeah, not sure that's something to be excited about, man. No sense in acting like someone pissed in my Cheerios, either. Guess you've got me there, Coop. I laughed dryly. Damn, I'm tired. What's got you down, big brother? He worries. I consider how much I want to tell him. I've always tried to keep him from seeing just how lonely I am. I know he's content with his life, but sometimes I wish he felt differently about his outlook on the future. The fuck and run we've both mastered over the years is getting old as hell. For once, I'm starting to wish I weren't so fucked up and I could find some normal Susie homemaker and make some normal life for myself. You ever get sick of this shit, Coop? I just spent the last seven days on the road chasing after this dirtbag that skipped out on his bail, again, only to come home to my empty apartment. Hell, I don't even really have an apartment. I pay for this crap weekly and there is nothing of mine here. All this furniture came with the rent. I don't know, brother. I guess I've just been wondering if there's more out there for me. For us. He's silent long enough for me to think that the call dropped, but he clears his throat and I sit, waiting to hear what he's going to say. This isn't the first time we've talked about wanting something more. Or rather, I've talked and he's listened silently. I didn't realize you were still feeling this way, Asher. He exhales. Just because I don't want more, ever, doesn't mean that you can't have it. Look, we had one fucked up childhood. Things got easier for you when you got older, and I guess I still see things differently. I refuse to ever be that weak motherfucker again. I'm in charge of my life, me alone, and I will never give another person the power to hurt me. I get it, man, I really do. The guys here seem to be dropping like flies, and their chicks aren't anything like she was. They're really amazing ladies. But even knowing that there's something different than her out there doesn't change my mind. He takes a deep breath, and I imagine him pacing around, collecting his thoughts. I'm happy with my life the way it is, Ash. I've got some great friends here, my own place, a job I love, and enough pussy to last me a lifetime. The only thing that could make that better is if you gave up that bounty hunter shit and came to work with us. Yeah, I'm not sure that's going to happen. I like the challenge of my work, I argue. Whatever. The point is, I don't need more to be happy. I've got a good life, brother, and if it were all over tomorrow, I wouldn't have one damn thing that I regret. You only live once, right? Did you just YOLO me? Damn, Coop, we need to get you graduated from high school, I laugh. Hardy har har, laugh all you want, you know I'm right. His deep chuckle comes through the line, and I smile. Picturing him standing there, smiling like a freaking idiot. Miss you, little brother. Yeah, and I kind of miss you too, big brother. We talk for a little while longer. He catches me up to speed on some of the shit he and the boys at Core Security have been dealing with. I've got to say, it sure as hell doesn't seem like the boring job I was picturing. By the time we hang up, I can already feel my eyes getting heavier. With promises to get together soon for a much-needed brother's vacation, I remind him to wrap up his junk, and with some quick I love yous later, I'm laying my head down on my pillow. Just talking to Coop makes me feel lighter than I did just minutes before. I hate that he feels the way he does about life in general. I know he thinks that he's right, that every woman out there is just like our mother and Sarah Jane was, but I can't help but pray that one day I can prove him wrong. That one day I can meet a woman who will show him just how fulfilling it would be to give yourself to someone completely. 
One day, I vow, one day, I'll make that happen. Chapter 28 Chelsea I'm so nervous. I keep running every possible scenario over in my mind. Asher will either decide to keep going down this dark path that I'm not sure my light will be able to keep him safe on, or he will turn it all over to the authorities, guaranteeing that dirty bastard spends the rest of his life in jail. My stomach has been in knots all morning. I wasn't able to eat breakfast, and I even threw up a few times. My nerves are completely shot to hell. I know Asher is worried about me, and I hate that because his mind shouldn't be focusing on me right now. But no matter what I do, I can't seem to turn off the overwhelming sense of dread that is hanging over me like a thick blanket. A thick blanket of doom. I hate it. Sunshine, please try and eat something before we head over to see us. I don't like how upset you are. I'll eat when we leave, okay? I might feel better by then. It's worth a try. He looks at me, trying to gauge where my mind is right now. I give him a weak smile and try my best to act normal. All right, if you're sure. I'm going to grab a shower before we head in. He leans in and gives me one of those sweet kisses, holding his warm lips against my cold forehead and rubbing his large hand over my belly a few times. When I hear the shower turn on, I let out the breath I was holding. Fuck, I'm a mess. And it doesn't help that my back has been killing me all week ever since I went on a nesting frenzy and cleaned every inch I could reach of the apartment. Then I spent an even longer time working in Zack's nursery. We purchased all of his furniture and got it all up, ready to go. It's a room fit for a prince. Well, it's a room fit for a prince if he decides that he wants to play sports when he gets older. Asher had so much fun picking out the bedding and decor for his room that I gladly went with the theme he wanted. He and Beck painted the walls a warm tan color that complements the dark hardwood floors perfectly, we got some warm cream rugs to place on the floor, and one large baseball-shaped one for the center of the room. He hung up the three large letters that spelled Zack's name on the wall last night, finally completing the room. We had two large cherry wood bookshelves that were already full of different sports memorabilia, books, and stuffed animals. After a very long shopping trip with Dee, Zack's closet is now stuffed with more clothes than a newborn baby could ever need. Hell, I'm pretty sure he has more clothes than both Asher and I have combined. I wander down the hall and open the door to his room. I smile when I see all of the small touches that Asher picked out himself, from the baseball-shaped beanbag seat that is definitely something Zack won't need for a few years, to the tiny football mobile that hangs above his crib, and my personal favorite, the framed photo of Coop that sits proudly on his dresser, facing his crib. I feel my heart melt when I think about how happy Asher was when he placed that picture there. He set it down, stepped away and considered its location in the room, then moved it a few more times. Each time he would circle the room and see what kind of view our son would have of his birth father. After closing the door silently, I make my way down the hall and into our bedroom to get dressed. Asher called the guys late last night and asked that they all meet us there at noon. All I can do now is hope that, at the end of the day, whatever is meant to happen does. I selfishly pray that the day ends with Asher turning over all of his evidence on Dominic Murphy. Asher's in the middle of shaving when I walk into the bathroom, dressed and almost ready to go. I decided to go for comfort today. At this point in my pregnancy, comfort is really all that matters, and with my nerves already going haywire, I need every advantage I can get. I have some loose-fitting maternity jeans, one of Asher's old USMC sweatshirt that still hangs large on my body, even with my expanding belly, and my favorite pair of worn chucks. Damn, you look hot in my clothes. He reaches down to adjust himself, and I smile when I see the thick bulge in his jeans. These days your clothes are the only things that fit. I guess it's time for me to go get some more fat girl clothes. I sound like a brat. I don't mean to, but I've been struggling with the new, wide version of my body. What have I told you, sunshine? I fucking love your body. Your body is changing and growing because it's keeping our son alive. Don't ever think of that as a bad thing. It's goddamn beautiful. He gives me a sweet kiss, laughing when he sees his shaving cream on my face, and then turns back to finish the task. With nothing left to do but wait, I head to my laptop and attempt to get some work done on my book. I'm actually shocked to say that it's almost done. With all the extra time I've had since I stopped working with Dee, I've stepped my writing up and everything else just started to fall into place. 
My story, the one I have been molding for years now, is finally coming to fruition, and I feel an overwhelming sense of pride in my story and, more importantly, in myself. I have Asher to thank for that, for encouraging me to follow my dreams and never give up. I am just finishing another chapter when I feel him walk up behind me. He cuddles close and kisses my head. Are you ready to go? he asks. Yeah, just let me save this and turn everything off. Once I've grabbed my purse off the back of my computer chair, I walk down the hallway and work on strengthening my courage for what's to come. Time to make sure the emotional basket case is locked up tight, and the strong woman Asher needs me to be right now is ready to play ball. I push all my fears, nerves, and worry aside, and get ready to walk the road less traveled with my fiancé. Damn, I love the sound of that. The drive to core security doesn't take long. Since the apartments are pretty centrally located to everything in town, we make the short drive in about ten minutes. I notice when we pull up that we're one of the first to arrive. Sway isn't even manning his normal spot, front and center, in his salon's front window. I swear, sometimes I wonder if that man even works. The only time I've ever seen him actually doing hair is when one of us girls goes in. Other than that, he's bopping around the room with his ever-present smile in place. I see Axel's huge black truck sitting next to Greg's minivan, rather Melissa's minivan. Other than that, the parking lot is pretty vacant. I guess that's normal for a Sunday afternoon. All the businesses around core security close up on Sundays. The guys are normally closed as well, but with this emergency meeting, they didn't waste any time coming together and being there when Asher said that he needed them. Those men truly are the definition of brotherhood. I come out of my musing when Asher's hand gives mine a small squeeze. I look down to where our hands are laced together on his thigh, before looking up and giving him a forced smile. He shakes his head and lifts my hand to give me a kiss. Everything's going to be okay, sunshine. Trust me, okay? I nod my head, not trusting my words. I just know that, if I open my mouth, all of my careful bravado will crumble— I get another squeeze of his hand before he lets go and climbs out. I watch his dirty blonde hair shine when the sun hits it. His face seems almost peaceful, and I don't even let myself think of what that could mean. Let's head on in, he says, reaching out to help me step down. Hey, I whisper, grabbing his arm before he starts walking towards the door. I love you. He gives me a heart-stopping smile, turning to wrap his arms around me. I love you, too, he says against my temple. It seems weird to walk into the lobby of core security and not see Emmy. I know there's a lot going on with her and Maddox right now, but this place just isn't the same without her bright smile greeting me. The last report I heard from Asher about those two was that he got a very short message from Maddox saying that he was handling shit and he had Cat. I don't know who the hell Cat is, but I hope that Emmy is okay with her. Even with Emmy gone... We usually had the pleasure of being greeted by a very attractive Davy. He's almost too attractive for his own good. His cheekbones are high and strong, his jaws perfectly square, and when he smiles, his blindingly white teeth seem to blink at you. The girls always joke that he looks like he walked straight off a runway and strutted right into CS, which I would believe since he managed to catch the eye of the master strutter himself, Sway. Those two have been a heavy and adorable item ever since they first met. The lights are dim in the lobby, since they aren't open for normal hours and are just coming in to meet in the conference room. There's a big light that comes from behind the large CS sign behind Davy's desk, and the light that hangs over Coop's memorial portrait. Other than that, it's just dark and ominous. I follow Asher's lead when he heads down the hallway that I know leads to their offices as well as the conference room in the back. Axel and Greg are in deep conversation about the pros and cons and hunting big game. I don't even want to know what the hell that means. I shiver at the thought, causing Asher to tighten his hold on my hand and look at me in question. I just shake my head and look around the room. Hey, guys, I say when we step into the room, doing my best to plaster on a happy smile. Hey, Chels, how are you feeling? Greg asks warmly. I'm doing okay, just tired. Pretty sure that's normal, though, all things considered. He laughs when I wave my hand over my big belly. You have no idea. Melissa was tired all the time. Just nap when you can. She said that helped. 
Izzy was the same with Nate. Things seem to be different this time around, though. Hang in there. You're almost done. Axel smiles at me, but before I can address them, I'm beat to the punch. Yeah, bet that's because it's a girl this time. Beck jokes when he joins the group. That would be interesting with how protective you are of Izzy and Nate. I can see it now. You're going to have that baby in a bulletproof bubble before she can talk. I laugh because, really, he probably isn't wrong. Axel is crazy about Izzy and Nate, almost to the point where it's overkill. She seems to love it, so I guess that works for them. Looking over at Asher, I think for the millionth time how lucky I am. He seems to have little bits of each of these strong alpha male's personalities in him. He has Axel's protectiveness without being over the top. If what Melissa tells us is correct, he shares Greg's bedroom skills. He has that huge heart of gold that Beck is famous for, and of course, he shares Maddox's strength and determination. I always found it fascinating how much these men all act like a family, but when you get right down to it, they really are brothers, just minus the shared DNA. Sometimes I think that makes their bond stronger. They fought together, worked together, and lived their lives together. They have that bond that some siblings will never have. Come on, sunshine. Have a seat. I'll go grab you a water. I sit in the proffered seat and look around the room, once again feeling the claws of dread latching into my skin, digging in deep and refusing to leave. Is everyone here? Greg asks from the head of the table. Not yet. Axel responds, walking up to Greg and punching him in the shoulder. Greg laughs and moves out of Axel's spot. Who isn't here yet? Beck asks, looking around the room. Me. I turn my head and shiver at the intensity of the gaze that locks with mine. Well, look what the cat dragged in, Beck says, walking over to give Maddox one of those weird, half-hug, half-backslap things that men do. When did you get back in town? I'm starting to feel a little uneasy with Maddox's black eyes still focused only on me. I don't think there are many people who could hold his gaze and not physically feel burned. He gives me just the barest of nods before stepping forward, a slight limp to his long gait. We've been back a few days now, he answers, coming around the table. He greets Axel and Greg the same way he did Beck. When he gets to Asher, my eyes widen. He pulls him close, his embrace different than the others, and turns his head to whisper something so that only Asher can hear. Asher's back gets tight, and I watch these two men interact with complete fascination. When Maddox finishes speaking to him, he pulls back, and whatever Asher says in response has a smile taking over his normally stoic mask— a smile that is so beautiful I let out a gasp before I can stop myself. Asher turns and gives me a smile of his own before pulling out the high back leather office chair and settling his large frame down. The guys are all speaking amongst themselves, so I take a moment to lean over and question Asher about what Maddox just said. Are you okay? That looked interesting. Yeah. He looks over at me, his clear blue eyes shining with a peace-like intensity, he just reminded me about something he told me a few months ago. He asked me how that darkness has been treating me, and damn, it felt good to tell him I've been standing in the middle of some hell of a sunshine for a while now. Even though his words kind of make sense to me, the fact that Maddox is asking has me baffled. Don't worry your pretty little head over it, Chelsea. It's good, I promise you. All right, let's get this started. Asher, why don't you go ahead and let us know what you need to talk to us about? Axel interrupts. I look around and notice that all four of the other men in the room have taken their seats, all staring intently at Asher and waiting for him to talk. Oh, God. This is it. I dig my fingers into the armrest on the chair, willing my body to calm down and my mind to stay sharp. This isn't about me. This is about Asher and making sure that he makes the best decision with the most favorable outcome. I know that. If anyone can see reason in his turning all of his information on Dominic Murphy over to the authorities, it will be these men. However, I also know that these men's sense of loyalty and passion runs deep. If they agree that vengeance is the way to go, there will be no way for me to talk him down from the ledge. As some of you know, I've spent a good bit of time looking into Dominic Murphy. His empire of evil is essentially what led to Coop's death. You all know the details on his connection, so I'll spare you those. I have been able to confirm from a few inside sources close to Dom that he did, in fact, put the word out that Coop's death had been taken to call on a debt. A debt that Coop didn't owe him. Dom doesn't care that he killed an innocent man. 
To him, it is nothing but a normal day in the office. Asher reaches out, pulls my hand off the armrest, and places it on his firm thigh before returning his eyes to the men around the table. It's taken me months to get everything I have on this man, to get the proof I needed to pin Coop's demise on him and to get enough piled up on him that I could bury him underneath prison. I've spent hours staking out his local businesses, places of leisure and homes. I know the identity of each one of his closest allies. If he breathes at this point, I'll know it. I've gotten close enough to place tracking devices on six of his known vehicles, as well as attached a few to his person, when I was lucky enough to get close at a few restaurants he frequents. Not much, and if he isn't wearing the jackets in question, or they aren't hanging within a close enough distance to pick up audio, they're basically worthless. He looks over at me to assess how I'm holding it together. I give him a few squeezes to his leg and urge him to continue. Whatever he sees in my eyes is enough that he gives me a small nod and turns back again. I've managed to collect audio confirmation about his involvement in Coop's murder. It might not be enough to convict him alone, but it is enough to paint him in one hell of a damning light. You managed to get this on your own without getting one of us to sit in on this with you? What the hell were you thinking? Axel booms from his seat. Brother, I understand where you're coming from, but putting yourself in danger won't help a damn thing. Well, with all due respect, brother, this wasn't your call to make. I've been safe. I've stayed hidden in the shadows, and trust me, he doesn't have a clue. If he did, he pauses looking over at me. If he did, then I wouldn't be sitting here right now. It was reckless, Asher, Greg throws in. Maybe so, but at the time, I didn't think I had anything to lose. Now. Now I know better. I can feel my throat getting tight, and I will the impending tears away, blinking rapidly, taking my eyes off of Asher's proud strength, which seems to be emanating from his body. I had a long chat with Chelsea last night. She has helped me see things in a new light, and the reason that I, that we, called you here is so that you can help me make this decision. I'm not sure that I can trust myself when it comes to seeing the logic. I want to lead with my heart, anger, and grief. I think I can say now that if I do that, then the outcome might not be favorable. That makes sense. Hard to be objective with a target when you're seeing your pain. Pain that he's responsible for, Axel grumbles. So tell us what you have, Beck stresses. Greg and Maddox remain silent, their eyes hard. It's hard for me to judge what's going through their heads. I know that each of these men had a different relationship with Coop. Beck's and Greg's were arguably the closest. I think Maddox and Coop had shared a bond as well. Hell, judging by the fury that is coming off of him in waves... My guess is that he was closer to Coop than any of us know. Some more audio that could be used to convince a more in-depth investigation on him. But let's face it, they might have him on their radar, but they haven't been looking hard enough. It took me a handful of months dedicated to trailing his every movement, another few months hacking into every system that Dominic might have touched with the smallest fingerprint, and a few unbelievably close calls. In that time... I managed to get a lock on at least six local warehouses that he is using to house his firearm trade. Another four that, best I can tell, are his packaging and distribution centers for his drug empire. Two houses owned by him or his second-in-command, Polly, that are keeping up his methamphetamine trade. I've also located close to the same in seven different towns scattered from New York to Miami. All of this has picture evidence of both the locations and visuals of Dom at each location. When he stops, I think he's done— my mind is spinning with everything I've just learned, how deep he has managed to coil himself in this vengeance he's seeking. It isn't until his voice breaks the silence that I realize just how close I came to him making this decision alone, and I fear, without him ever telling anyone what he had planned. I could have lost him, and judging by just how powerful this man is, I doubt I ever would have known what happened to him. I've gotten some recent intel from my inside source that there is a meet scheduled for this coming Saturday between Dom and another man from Chicago, Dino, to make the final transaction in one of the largest drug and firearm deals we've seen. I'm talking billions of dollars worth of just guns alone. They're meeting in Chicago, Dino's turf, and from what I can tell from my guy on the inside, this was Dom's way of expressing his loyalties to the cause, whatever the case. Jesus Christ! Maddox spits through clenched teeth. Greg nods in agreement. You aren't lying, Mad. Let me get this straight. You've been sitting on this for all of this time for what, exactly? Axel asks. I hold my breath and wait for Asher to continue. 
knowing that this is the moment when these men will pick sides. They will pick sides and essentially decide my man's fate. So that I can avenge my brother's murder. Chapter 29 Chelsea It takes only seconds after Asher hissed out those eight words. Those eight words that will either be his demise or his salvation. In that short time, the room explodes with voices of concern, outrage, anger, and understanding. I can't tell with all their yelling which is winning. Excuse me, I tried to say over the testosterone fest that is raging within the conference room's four solid walls. They don't even spare me a glance. Each one of them is speaking over the other, trying to be the lone voice that gains the upper hand and gets to speak first. Hell no. There is no way I'm going to sit back and let them help make the call that would define my future. No way. That would not only be tempting fate with Asher's own life, but if I know anything about these men, it is that they would never let Ash go at this alone, effectively making this a call that will affect all of their futures and those of their families. Excuse me, I try again, raising my voice slightly. When that still doesn't work, I push myself up, the chair wheeling back with a force so strong that it slams against the wall behind me. They still don't even stop to look at me. Looking around the room for something that will help me gain the upper hand, I see Maddox watching me with a small smirk on his face. He isn't even attempting to stick his voice into the uncontrolled war around us. I'm not sure what compels me to act like a child, but seeing him just sitting there doing nothing causes my already rising temper to shoot through the roof. I place my hands on my hips, cock my head to the side and stick my tongue out at him. Well, it seems as if Basket Case has decided to come and play today. I see his shoulders move with his silent laughter, and then he pushes up from the table and walks around the short distance to me, all the while going completely unnoticed by the other men in the room. They just keep yelling over each other. Maddox dips his head low, his face just inches from mine, and I try my hardest not to cower under his intense gaze. He's standing so close that I can feel the heat of his nose against my own. He gives me one sharp nod, shifts to the right, and brings his mouth to my ear. You make sure and keep that damn light shining bright on him. You give a broken man like me hope that there might be something to be said about trusting that blaze that fights a man's demons. Then he pulls back just as quickly. I get one hell of a smile before he places his hands on my hips, turns my body to face the men in the room and lifts me up. I flail for a second until I realize that he's helping me onto the conference table. He doesn't remove his hands, making sure that I'm safe on my perch. Excuse me! I scream. The room falls silent, and all four of the grown toddlers fighting over the last cookie turn to look at me with shock. Greg's and Beck's eyes go wide, Axel roars with laughter, but Asher's face turns hard as he looks at Maddox with nothing short of bared vehemence. I suggest you get your fucking hands off my woman, he fumes. Maddox doesn't move. He keeps his hold on my hips, and I see Asher's eye twitch. I'll fucking kill you, he vows. Oh, be quiet, you overgrown ape, I scream down at him. His blue eyes are alight with anger, but I can see the shock starting to hit him with my tone. That's right. All of you just shut up for a second. Sitting here and pissing all over each other isn't going to accomplish anything. But I have something to say, and you're damn well going to listen to me. Maddox's fingers flex against my hips in encouragement. I will agree with Asher that this asshole, this vile excuse for a human, needs to pay for what he did, and every crime he's committed since Coop's death. I firmly believe that he needs one hell of a kick in the ass. He needs to suffer, and he needs to suffer for a long time. That being said, going off half-cocked to seek some vigilante type of justice? Newsflash, you boys are not invincible, and there are a lot of people who love you, who don't want to see something terrible happen to you. I look around the room while I gauge the best way to express myself. Tell me this. Would Coop, for one second, want you all to be putting your lives on the line just so that you can avenge him? Well, I'll tell you this much. He damn sure wouldn't. I might not have known him as long or as well as you all did, but I knew a man who lived each day as if it were his last. He laughed often. He loved fiercely. He was strong, brave, and courageous. He was a man who knew right down to the last second what he was giving up by stepping in front of that bullet. 
Maddox's hands clench so tight that I have to bite my cheek to keep from crying out in pain. He assessed the situation, and he decided that he would be the hero he was meant to be. He would be sick if he knew that any one of you were willing to follow him into the grave just to punish the man responsible. I looked down at Asher, his earlier anger washed away, and he's looking up at me with something close to shocked pride. His memory will never be anything short of miraculous. Asher, baby, he doesn't need this vengeance in the way that you have planned— you don't need to kill another man to make this wrong right. Make him pay, suffer, and spend the rest of his days locked in a cell with no hope of ever seeing the outside again. I'm begging you, baby. I don't want our son to lose another father. We need you, I stress. I pat Maddox's hands, letting him know that I'm ready to get down. He easily lifts me off the table and gently places my feet on the floor. I turn, give him a brief hug, and turn back to Asher. I walk as close as I can, or as close as my belly will allow, placing both of my palms on his chest and looking up into his sad face. I would never be able to give you up without a fight, Asher. I told you a long time ago that I'm with you every step of the way, but I need you to understand me and why I feel the way I do about this. This is about so much more than giving your brother peace. You need to look at the bigger picture. If you go through with this, you're not only risking your life— but each one of these men who stand with you. Whether they agree with you or not, you know they would follow you into the depths of hell, and if that happens, there are a lot more people than just me who stand to lose their persons. His eyes flash, comprehension finally dawning within. I need you. They need you. Zack needs you. And as much as it pains me to say this, whatever you decide— I will do my best to be the strength you need to ensure that you have everything needed to make it happen. You and me, baby. It's you and me. I can hear the others moving around us. Their chairs are rolling back to the table and they're sitting back. The energy that was going wild just moments before is now sober. I continue to hold Asher's gaze, pouring all my love into this look. He closes his eyes, drops his forehead to mine, and lets out a rushed breath. I hear you, sunshine. He turns back to the room, moving his chair back to the table and taking a seat. He pulls me into his lap and places his hand on my belly before addressing the men silently waiting. We call Robert with the ATF, get with Mitchell over with DEA, and I'll call Stan with the FBI. Let's make sure Dominic Murphy goes down and pays for a long fucking time. I let the tension leave my body, and the mammoth amount of fear, anxiety, and pain washes out in one big rush. I collapse back on Asher, his arms tightening around me, and I say a silent prayer that everything is going to be okay. I look over at Maddox moments before my eyes close, and the stress of the situation bleeds from my body. He meets my gaze, gives me a nod and a warm smile. His approval that I did the right thing. Yes, Everything is going to be just fine. I close my eyes, my head resting against Asher's chest, his heartbeat thumping against my ear. The voices around me, making plans and finalizing decisions, lull me into a deep sleep. Chapter 30 Chelsea Things started rolling quickly after that, when they made the calls they needed to make and showed the heavy evidence that Asher had collected against Dominic, it was a whirlwind of crazy. It seemed like hundreds of men ascended on our small town. Asher and all the guys seemed to live in the office. I overheard Izzy telling Dee that Maddox has even been sleeping a few nights there between his computer searching. Asher makes a point to come home each night. I think he needs it just as much as I do. But either way... I'm happy that his arms are wrapped tight around me when I drift off. Sway called an emergency meeting today, so I've been waiting for Dee to swing by and pick me up before we head over to the salon. It's the Thursday before the big meet is supposed to happen, and the guys are spending a few more hours in the office going over last-minute business. I know Asher is struggling with his decision, but I also know that he's made the right one, and I'll do my best to help him come to terms with that. How are you today, Miss Avery? Joe asks when I step into the lobby. Dee just called, saying that she was ten minutes away and to be ready so we don't miss the show. 
I'm doing well, Joe. Thank you for asking. How are you doing? Anything exciting happening in the building? Oh, just the same old, same old. We got a few new renters. One right on your floor and some on the lower floors. Had a dog steal Mrs. Marx's wig right off her head the other day. Never thought I would see the day that woman ran after something. He laughs. I bet that was a sight to see. Did she run with her walker? Mrs. Marx is a mean old lady who's pushing ninety-five. I don't think I've ever seen her move quicker than shuffle speed. The thought of her running after a dog has uncontrollable giggles escaping. By the time Dee walks into the lobby, Joe and I are in peals of laughter, the sound booming through the otherwise quiet lobby. Hey, Joe, Dee sings. Well, hello there, Miss Dee. What a pleasure it is to see you. I hope everything is going well with that man of yours. Hey, how come you never call me Ms. Chelsea? He looks confused for a second before a smirk curls his wrinkled lips. Ms. Avery, you've never asked me to, he jests. Oh, well, please do. Both Dee and Joe laugh at my embarrassment. He's amazing, Joe. We're getting married soon. Can you believe it? Yes, Miss Dee, I can believe it. He looks over at me, and I know it's coming before he opens his mouth. And I hear there's a congratulations in order for you and Mr. Cooper as well. I hear Dee gasp, and before I can answer Joe, she snatches my hand in hers. Holy shit, she mumbles. Holy shit, you didn't tell me? Thanks, Joe. I'm extremely happy. He gives me a nod, and I make quick work of saying our goodbyes. Dee doesn't let go of my hand the entire time. We climb into her car, after she was kind enough to let go of my hand, and she gives me a second to buckle my seatbelt before turning on me, the questions flying rapidly out of her mouth. How did he ask? Oh, my God, when did it happen? Were you shocked? I bet you cried. Have you set a date? We should go look at dresses this weekend. Well, maybe we should wait until after the baby comes before we do that, she giggles. Holy shit, Chelsea, everyone is going to freak out. I can't believe you didn't tell me. Jesus, Dee, take a breather. We didn't tell anyone. There hasn't been a chance. We were planning on telling you guys after everything settled down some more. I'm so happy for you, for both of you. You deserve this happiness. All three of you do. Thank you. I'm unbelievably happy. Sway is going to freak. I lay my head back and prepare myself for the frenzy I'm sure this day will turn into. Hey, Beck mentioned something to me when he got back the other day. You know when you guys had this meeting at CS? I nod, questioning where she's going with this. He mentioned the name Zack. Is that what you decided to name the baby? I turn and look at her, wondering when I let Zack's name slip. It makes sense that I would have. Emotionally, the stakes were so high in that conference room that I used every tool I had to get Asher to listen. If he wouldn't have for me, I know he would have for Zack. We hadn't wanted to tell anyone what we were having, so I'm kind of upset that not only is his gender known, but also his name. Yeah, we decided to name him Zack. I speak softly. It doesn't really matter if they know, and we can still share the meaning behind his nickname when he's born. I mentally remind myself to fill Asher in on everyone knowing. I'm sorry, did I say something wrong? She hesitantly asks while merging into traffic. No, nothing's wrong. I just didn't realize that I had said Zack's name. We had planned on waiting till he was born to announce it. I'm sorry, Chelsea, if it makes you feel better. I think I'm the only one who knows. Beck just asked me if I'd heard anything about it. There's nothing to be sorry about. I've got a healthy baby boy, a great fiancé, and... And I just sent my book off to my editor, Mickey. Trust me, Dee. It's okay. Holy shit, Chelsea! That's amazing! Congratulations! Thank you. I'm still terrified, but I figure I would regret it if I never tried. I agree. I can't wait to read it. I smile at her and we continue to make small talk before we pull into the parking lot where Sway's salon is located, as well as Dee's small insurance company and the core security offices. Dee loops her arm through mine, and we take off across the parking lot. I have to struggle to keep up with her. Her ever-present heels are eating up the pace quicker than I can waddle after her, I've turned into a damn teeter-totter the last few days. The only things that have grown on my body are my boobs and belly, but it still feels like I have an extra hundred pounds to carry around. Slow down, you crazy woman! I hiss when I almost fall on my face. Hey, you just need to figure out how to get that watermelon to sway with you, she giggles. Whoa, this belly doesn't sway. I haven't swayed in way too long. 
I just kind of march, heavy and with a weird sidestep to keep my hips from grinding. She shudders. That sounds terrible. I laugh. It really isn't that bad. I think the positives by far outweigh the pain I might be feeling for a few more weeks. I try to keep it positive, but truth be told, I'm miserable. I just want to be done being pregnant and hold my son in my arms. Unfortunately, I still have some time. My last doctor's appointment confirmed that Zack is measuring well past his gestational age. Dr. Sosa laughed and told me politely that the baby must take after his linebacker father. I don't ever correct her when she assumes that Asher is the father. To us, he will be, and the detail of Zack's conception isn't anyone else's business but our own. I guess you're right, she says reverently. Maybe one day, but for now, we're having too much fun practicing. She winks at me and pushes the door to the salon open wide. Hey, everyone! Guess who's engaged? She screams at the top of her voice. My face instantly heats, but I laugh right along with her when every one of our friends pounces. My hand is pulled in a million directions. Congratulations are squealed and screamed. By the time all the girls have stopped gawking at my beautiful ring, I look up and see Sway, hands on his hips and his eyebrow raised. You better get that fine ass over here, Mama, he sasses. I excuse myself from his receptionist's grasp and walk over to where he's standing. Like normal, he's dressed loudly. You look good, Sway. How much weight have you lost now? I implore, hoping that he won't make a big deal about this. Don't you try and distract me now, honey. I know I look good. Between Davy helping me work out at the gym and at home, oh, lordy Lou, you would think I would have those sexy six-pack abs all of you girls' fine men have. But enough about me and how fabulous I am. He moves one heavily braceleted arm to his hip, sticking his other hand in my direction and waving it as if I'm supposed to magically know what he's demanding. Don't make me wait all day, you vixen. Give me that hand. I laugh and bring my left hand up. He oh-so-delicately jerks me forward and pulls my hand closer. I can hear him humming and awing as he gazes at it in rapture. I try to put myself in his shoes, his very tall, heeled shoes, and look at my ring from his eyes. Asher went slightly overboard, but I can't help but smile every time I look at it. The large round diamond is set high on a triple band of diamonds. It's relatively simple— if you can overlook the obnoxious size of diamonds sitting on those stunning thin bands. He explained to me that he knew right away when he saw the ring that it was the one. He wanted something special, something I could look at and remember how much he loves me, but also something that would represent our son and what brought us together. Coop. So he clarified that each band stood for the men in my life, one for him, Zack, and Coop. By the time he finished telling me that story, I was crying hysterically, he just laughed and pulled me closer. Your arm's going to kill you carrying that big diamond around, but holy Mr. Bojangles, it is stunning. Sway drops my hand and spins in a circle on his heels. His blouse bellows around him as he twirls, and when it lifts in the back, I notice, with jealousy, how tight his ass looks. Did you just say Mr. Bojangles? Izzy laughs from behind me. Don't you make fun of me, you sassy woman, you... You just make it so easy, Dee giggles. Humph, I do not, he smiles. We spend the next five hours gossiping, getting pampered within an inch of our lives, and watching all of the men come and go from the core security offices. Not a single one is one of our boys. And by the time Dee drops me off at home, my stomach hurts from how often I laughed. Chapter 31 Asher it's killing me, knowing that Chelsea is just next door, and I'm not able to go see her. With all of the red tape we've been trying to fight through, and meeting after meeting to brief each tactical team on everything I know, I feel like my mind is about to explode. We have finally finished all of our meetings today. Dominic Murphy will be going down, and there isn't a damn thing that can stop it now. He has so much shit piled on the scales against him, all of the evidence I'm responsible for bringing to light. I expect you to feel upset over losing my chance at vengeance, but I know that Chelsea is right. Coop would hate this, and what's important is that I'm around for my family. If something would have gone wrong and I was taken from Chelsea, just the thought kills me. 
After the last handshake from the suit from the FBI, I wait until he leaves my office, my official office, and breathe a sigh of relief. It's over. In two short days, Dominic will go down. Even though Coop's murder is my motivation in this, it feels good to know that someone as disgusting as him will be taken off the streets. The sense of pride that fills me when I think about how, or rather, by whom, all of this was set in motion is all-consuming. I'm not even upset that I won't be a part of the takedown. I don't need to be there. I don't need anything but the verification that he's behind bars when it's over. I've done my part, and in turning all my intel over, I've also guaranteed Chelsea's and Zack's safety. There hasn't been anything else threatening since that one letter. I instantly pulled back and stopped being so reckless in my hunt of Dom. I used the internet to silently weave in and out of his life. Thank God, because his being clueless means that Chelsea is no longer in danger. It's time to live our lives for the future we're building, and I can't wait. You getting ready to head out? I look up and take in Maddox's casual stance. I was thinking about it. Did you see the girls leave yet? Yeah, headed out about five minutes ago. All right, so tell me why you're standing there keeping me from getting home to my woman? One thing about Maddox is that when he speaks, you listen. So I know he wouldn't be here if he didn't think this was worth it. He's a man of few words, and I can respect that. And I owe him for waking my ass up when I would needed it. I'm not sure if I would be where I am right now had it not been for him. He walks into the room and shuts the door behind him. He takes a few slow steps before sitting in the chair across from me. Once he's settled in, his arms rest against each armrest. His fingers laced in front of him. He doesn't say anything for the longest time, just observes me in an eerie silence. I'm proud of you, brother, he finally says. Thanks, Maddox. I owe it to you, you know. I'm not sure anyone could have knocked some sense into me quite like you did. You made me see the hell I was letting myself become consumed with. I look away, getting a hold of my emotions. I wouldn't have any of this if you hadn't reminded me that there were still things worth living for. I wouldn't have one hell of a woman who was about to become my wife, a son on the way. And most importantly, with this shit we just finished up here this week, I wouldn't have peace with Coop's death. I didn't do anything but remind you what's important. Far as I can see, you did all the hard work. Just remember, there are going to be days when that darkness starts creeping up on you. You can feel it starting to whisper against your skin, see it out of the corner of your eyes. And sometimes it's right on your heels. It's not easy, Ash. Sometimes it's a daily war against no one but yourself. If you need me, I'm here. I clear my throat and nod. He's so spot on with how it feels when I have a bad day, when the grief and sadness of missing my brother become too much to bear. Congratulations, by the way. I noticed that rock on her hand the other day. You deserve this, Asher, and she's one hell of a warrior to have in your corner. That she is, I reply with pride dripping from my words. I wait a few moments and study Maddox. He looks exhausted. I can tell that the last few months have been hard for him. I know enough that he's been fighting Emmy to come home, but as far as details, he's been dead silent on those. How are things with Emmy? I hedge. His eyes flash, pain and exasperation in the forefront. She's back, so there's something. He doesn't say anything else, and judging by his tone, if I pressed it, he wouldn't take that well. Whatever the hell's going on between them seems to just be getting worse. You were there when I needed you, man. Don't go at this like you're alone, okay? It's sometimes for the best that way. I'm happy for you and Chelsea. Really, I am. But Emmy deserves better than anything I could ever give her. I open my mouth to lay into him like he did to me just months before, but stop and hold up my hand for him to wait when my cell starts ringing. Hey, sunshine! The grin I'm sporting has Maddox pushing himself up to stand. I notice distractedly that he seems to be moving slower than normal today. Chelsea, are you there? I wait, wondering why the hell she's calling me if all I'm going to hear is some weird scuffling noises. It sounds like she dialed me from her purse or something. Chelsea? I try one more time. 
Maddox turns from where he's about to walk out of the room. His eyes are narrowed in a way that has every hair on my body tingling with dread. Chelsea, please, I mutter. Please, sunshine. My stomach feels like it's full of lead. I don't move the phone from my ear as I start moving papers from my desk, looking for my keys. I look up when Maddox lets out a quick whistle. He holds his own keys up and nods his head towards the door. He doesn't have to fucking tell me twice. With the phone to my ear, I make my way behind Maddox. I'm praying over and over that my gut is wrong and that she just accidentally forgot to lock her phone. But I stop dead, just steps away from the front door to core security. When I hear her ear-piercing scream break through the static in the line, my blood runs cold and I sprint into action. I reach Maddox's charger ahead of him, waiting impatiently as he hurries to the driver's seat. He doesn't ask questions. He just throws the car in gear and speeds out of the parking lot. I keep the phone pressed tight to my ear, praying to hear something else that will give me a clue as to what we're about to walk into. Fuck me. An image of Dominic Murphy flashes through my mind and a sob bubbles out when I think that by not killing that bastard when I could have, I could lose everything. We've only been on the road for a minute at the most when I hear another voice, this one making a cold sweat break out across my skin. I can't make out her words, but I would know that fucking nasally whine anywhere. Sarah fucking Jane. Chapter 32. Sarah Jane. It's just a matter of time now. Only time. Time is all I have. And I don't mind waiting just a little longer. I've let him have his fun. Eight long years of fun. I've been watching. I'm always watching. He's never had anyone like this woman, this pregnant woman. I know my Asher would never give another woman my baby. I've been planning it for years. Our baby will be so beautiful. Long, silky blonde hair, just like her daddy. The prettiest eyes that you've ever seen. So blue that they look like the clearest summer day's sky. And her lips would be full. Just like her daddy, Asher. Yes, it has to be a mistake, because my Asher would never let my baby grow in that whore's body. I watched her walk out just this morning. Her laughter making me want to slice her throat right there in front of her tall friend and the old fat doorman. She's a whore. A whore that has had her filthy hands on my Asher. My head feels tight again. The voices are back. They keep telling me what needs to happen next. I need to make her pay. She needs to understand that she will never take my man and my baby. After grabbing my purse, I press the button for the lower garage while the tenants park their vehicles. I know which one belongs to that whore. I run my fingers all over just imagining what it would feel like if it were her skin. So fragile when using the right tools. I pull the hammer out of my large bag walking around the car a few times before deciding where to start. I slam my weapon against the headlights, then the taillights. I use all my strength to smash it against every inch of the car's metal. When I step back to admire my art, my chest moves fast as sweat coats my skin. I can't wait until I can do the same thing to that whore's body. Before I leave, I grab the can out of my bag, walk over to her car and lean over carefully. I wouldn't want to cut my body— Asher loves my body the way it looks, and I've worked hard to keep it slim, tight, and tan. Shaking the can a few times, I bring it closer to my destroyed carnage of that whore's car, taking my time to make sure every letter is perfect. I toss the can on the ground when I'm done. I don't need it anymore. The only thing I need now is that whore and my hammer. I press the button I need before reaching into my bag and grabbing my candies, opening the bottle and taking two for good measure. I need to remember to get more. I hate the way I feel when I'm not feeling my candies. I make quick work of my next duty. I need to make sure that Asher has a clear path to finally come and take me in his arms. He's going to be so happy to see me. I just know it. He's been waiting so patiently for me to come and take him back. It doesn't take much for me to sneak up on the old coot that sits in his office all day, only coming out occasionally to say hi to the other idiots that walk in and out of his lobby. He's launching an old friend's rerun when I peek in the cracked doorway. I can see his master keys hanging from his belt. This would be so much easier if he were sleeping, but oh well, the show must go on. I use the handle of my hammer and crack it against his temple. 
He goes down like the dead weight he is, and I don't waste a second grabbing the keys. I know exactly where I need to go now. I've been watching. I'm always watching. Always watching. Until now. Chapter 33, Chelsea. Thirty minutes earlier. I had fun today, I tell Dee while she pulls out of the parking lot, headed back to the apartment. But I'm exhausted. You're always exhausted. Hey, how do you have sex with that big old belly in the way? Are you serious? I chuckle. Well, yeah. Does it get in the way or does Asher, like, I don't know, bang into it? Oh, my God. Does this dick hit the baby? I look over at her, my mouth agape trying to figure out if she's joking with me right now. She looks over, rolls her eyes and stresses. I'm not pulling your leg, Chelsea. I'm serious right now. I need to know these things. If Beck and I decide to have kids, I don't think I could give up sex. There's no damn way. But I don't want my kid to come out with a cheese head because his daddy's ding-dong kept playing whack-a-mole. I burst out laughing, complete with snorting and almost choking on my spit. Holy shit, Dee. How can you be so clueless about something that is so natural for a woman's body? No, there is no chance that the baby will have a... How did you put it? Oh, a cheese head. I snort again. Sex isn't off limits. But now that I've gotten bigger, we have to get more creative. I prefer doggy style. Just makes it easier with all the pressure my body has. No need to worry, Dee. You won't have to give up sex when you get pregnant. She's shaking her head rapidly, looking pleased with the news. Wait a minute. Dee, I question. Hmm... She responds, lost in thought. Are you pregnant? I hope she is. I know that she had the worst parents in the world, but she and Beck would make amazing parents. What? Oh, no, well, I don't think so, at least. Well, damn. Do you want to be? I sigh. I've just been thinking about it a lot lately. Between you, Izzy, being pregnant again, Melissa with the twins all tiny and cute, it's just been on my mind more than normal. I worried when they got older and weren't all adorable babies anymore that they would be gross, but Cohen and Nate are two cool kids, so I think I'm open to it now. That's good, Dee. If you want to talk about it, just let me know. Maybe sit down with Beck and see where he stands with it. Maybe he wants to wait a little while. I mean, don't you want to get married first? Some people might be bothered by the fact that I'm not married and pregnant, but then again, they would probably drop dead if they knew I was knocked up with my fiancé's brother's baby. To each their own. Normal is boring anyways. Of course I do. We're setting a date soon. Now that things have settled down, I think it's time for me to make an honest man out of him. We laugh together and enjoy the rest of the car ride, talking about how long we think the latest Kardashian marriage will last and the newest purses we saw on our favorite site. When she pulls up to the front of my building, we make plans for dinner next week. I wave her off and walk into the building. Going to wave to Joe, I frown when I notice that he isn't standing in his normal spot. Damn, this place looks weird without him standing there smiling at me. Oh well, he must have gotten called away. I was halfway across the lobby when I remembered that I left my laptop in my car yesterday when I went to work at Starbucks. I laughed to myself when I recall Asher picking on me because I went into a coffee shop to work when I can't even drink it. Hey, what can I say? I love the smell. It's one of the best places to people watch. I bypass the button to my floor and press the one that will take me under the building to where our parking garage is located— Digging in my bag as I walk towards my car does nothing to help me find my keys. I grab my phone and stick it in my back pocket before starting my search up again. Feeling the cold metal, I close my hands around them and go to pull them out. When I lift my head, I freeze at what I see. My car is demolished. A total mess of what once was perfect. There isn't an inch of my car that isn't covered in scratches, dings, and dents, and red paint? My mind is telling me that there's no way I'm seeing this right. Maybe I'm on some sick version of punked. Dead center of what used to be my hood is five perfectly sprayed letters. Whore. My heart is pounding in my chest, and I try to push down the feeling of helplessness as I turn and run as best as I can back to the elevator car. I jam my finger over and over on the door close button. I pray that whoever did that to my car isn't about to slam their hand between the doors, cutting off my escape. When the doors finally close, I rub my hands over Zack's baby bump and will myself to calm down. I can't be getting this upset. I'm sure whoever did this is long gone. I bet they even got the wrong car. 
It was probably meant to be Wendy Westlake's car, and they got mine instead. Our cars are almost identical. She has a door across from our apartment, and I swear it's open later than Taco Bell. Everyone knows they stay open late. My body is still shaking, and I can't seem to calm down. When the car dings on my floor, I make my way to our door with wooden legs. I just need to get inside and call Asher. He'll know what to do. My hands are shaking so badly that I drop my keys twice. Bending over is a blast when you've got a large beach ball in your front. I feel my jeans get tight across my ass, and I groan when I hear my phone start making noises like the touchscreen has been activated. I swear I butt-dial more people that way. I throw the door open and rush in, pressing myself against the door and letting out the breath I was holding. Now that I'm safe in my apartment, I allow my body to really start feeling the fear of seeing my car smashed and beaten, vandalized with so much brutal force. I go to grab myself in my pocket, but stop dead when I see her. A scream escapes my lips, and I feel my heart drop. Ice-cold terror is picking up speed inside my body, making me feel faint and powerless. She's standing in the middle of my living room with a hammer swinging in one hand, the other holding one of Zack's stuffed animals. I shift my weight, wondering if I could reach the doorknob and get out before she could reach me. My plans are ruined when she sees my intent and growls. Don't fucking move, whore! I don't know who this woman is, but if she thinks she's going to do something to harm my life, my baby, then she's got another thing coming. I straighten my shoulders and vow silently to Zack that Mommy will protect him. She takes a menacing step towards me, and I pray for a miracle. Chapter 34 Chelsea. What do you want? I'm proud of myself for keeping my voice steady, for not letting her see the fear that is taking over my system. You really are a stupid whore, aren't you? Her nasally voice sounds so flat, almost dead, and when it fills my ears it just adds to the terror. If it's money you want, here, take my purse, I plead. We don't have any jewelry or valuables here. Her eyes flashed to my left hand, and I could curse my beautiful diamond. Oh, I beg to differ, whore. You have everything of value to me. Let me tell you a story, hmm? She walks closer to me, and I stand my ground, refusing to give her the benefit of my cowering. Get your fat ass in there and sit the fuck down, she hisses, grabbing my hair and bringing the wooden end of the hammer up to slam against my cheekbone. The longer end clips the top of my eye, and it causes stars to immediately dance in front of me. Okay. That hurt. Tears are burning my cheeks, and I can feel something warm running down my cheek. When I don't move quickly enough, she curls her fist tighter and forces me to the ground in the middle of the living room. I twist and steady myself so I don't fall on my stomach. I can feel Zack kicking and rolling, and I close my eyes in relief that he's okay. She grabs some duct tape out of her bag and walks behind me to bind my wrists painfully together. She throws the tape off to the side, and I hear it crash into something, sending it shattering against the hard wood. I don't dare take my eyes off of her, though. I need to keep my wits about me if I'm going to get us out of this alive. Time for your good night story, little whore. There once was a beautiful woman. She had the most expensive clothes, all the money she could ever want, and a body every woman around would die for. And she had the most handsome prince in all the land— that prince was perfect, you see, and he wanted to give the princess everything she ever wanted. What she wanted was to rule her kingdom. Now I'll skip all the boring parts. But her prince has been lost. You see, he wasn't lost to the princess. She always knew where to find her prince. He needed some time to remember how much he craves his princess. So she has waited patiently. She takes a break from her twisted tail, she just stares at me with this dazed and confused look on her face. I swear she can't even focus. Her eyes keep getting larger and then squinting. I've been watching. I'm always watching, she mumbles. I watched in shocked horror as she spins the hammer even faster. Her confusion to the reality around her is making her one deadly hammer-wielding lunatic. Who are you? I implore my head snaps back when she cracks me again with the wooden handle. I lock my body and only sway slightly. God damn, that one hurt worse. 
Who am I? She screeches, the sound making my eardrums protest. Who am I? I am Sarah Jane Clarkston, and I'm here to finally take my prince back and to remove my baby from your whore body before you taint her. I watch in horror as she starts jamming the blunt end of the hammer into one of her eyes, mumbling over and over. I've been watching. I'm always watching. She digs at her hair, pulling out chunks at a time and throwing them on the floor. My mouth drops when she takes her blunt nails and claws them down her face before she pushes her arm out wide, then slams her fist into her face. What in the fucking hell? While she's busy coming completely fucking unhinged, I try my hardest to get the tape off. I realize quickly enough that there's no use. She has it so tight that I'm already starting to lose feeling in my fingers. She stops her abuse to her face and starts crawling around on the floor. She's still mumbling under her breath. I've been watching. I'm always watching. I take advantage of her distraction and start looking around for something to use, something that can free my hands. I spot one of my decorative vases that must have been what took the hit when Crazy Pants over there tossed the tape. I look around, seeing if any of the broken pieces made it my way. There, about two feet from my leg, is a piece that will be perfect. Now I just need to get to it, checking to see how my new friend is. I notice that she's now curled up next to my couch, rocking and slamming her fist against her head. Her other hand still holds the hammer tight, banging it over and over against the floor. I move slowly, using my legs to inch closer and closer, only moving small inches at a time. I get where I can reach it as I sit on my ass, so I carefully and quietly as possible bring one of my legs out from under me, shifting on my ass to get my other leg out. My whole body is burning from the use of muscles I haven't used in months. When I get settled on my ass, I look over to make sure once again that she isn't paying me any attention. My fingers reach out blindly, pushing the piece of glass a few times as I fumble around. I finally get my fingers around the sharp shard and begin the process of moving back onto my knees. I don't want her to know that I've moved, but more importantly, I don't want her to have any more of a height advantage if she comes to stand over me again. At least up on my knees I have something going for me. Once back on my knees, I make the painful shift back over to my original position. The whole time I busy myself with moving the glass back and forth against my bindings— I want to scream in pain each time the sharp ends jam into my skin. Either my wrists or my fingers, hell, maybe both, are cut so badly that I'm struggling to hold on to the glass in my hands. I can feel the tape give slightly at the same time that her head snaps up and she looks me in the eyes. It's all your fault, you fucking whore. You tempted him, made him touch your body. It's all your fault. I keep sawing at the tape that binds my wrists and pray that I can get it loose before it's too late. Her eyes are starting to look wild, and I know there isn't much time. She heaves her large bag up and starts digging around. She brings up a few baggies of little white pills until she seems satisfied with the one she has. I can't see how many pills the bag holds. Looks like maybe three or four. She dumps them all in her hand and throws them into her mouth. After bringing a bottle of water out of her bag, she dumps it over her mouth, most of it falling around her mouth and running down her neck. By the time she appears to have had enough, she is soaking wet. I've been watching! I'm always watching! She screams and starts to charge towards me. The hammer in her hand comes up over her head. I watch with stark terror as the hammer gets higher and higher with each step she takes towards me. Drop it! I hear from just over my shoulder, the voice strong, commanding, and in total control. Drop the fucking hammer now, or so help me God I will shoot you! the voice promises. I make another sharp dig against the tape, opening my mouth wide in a silent scream. The last thing I want to do right now is remind this chick that I'm still in the room. I rip off the remaining tape, fumbling a few times because my hands are soaked with my blood. Drop it, the voice reminds. I keep my eyes focused on Sarah Jane and her hammer. I back up against the far wall and hold my arms over my stomach, praying that I'll feel Zack start to move soon. Sarah Jane goes to take another step, and the sudden boom of a gunshot ringing out in the confined space has me screaming out. I curl into myself as much as my belly will allow. Don't fucking move. This time I won't be as nice and I'll aim for something more important than your shoulder. I'm watching. I'm always watching. You don't know what this whore took from me. And I don't fucking care. I shiver at the coldness that's come over the voice to my side. One more time. Drop. 
the hammer. I'm going to bash you to pieces when I finish with the war, Sarah Jane promises. I hear her snarl and it sounds like her feet shuffling forward. I close my eyes tight and brace for whatever happens next, making sure that my arms are still covering as much of my stomach as possible. I scream when I hear another shot and start to cry uncontrollably. I scream and cry, beg and plead. It isn't until minutes later when I feel a small, warm hand lightly touch my shoulder that I dare to look up. When I see Emmy's honey-colored eyes looking back into mine, I cry louder. She pulls me into her arms and lets me use her to be my strength since mine is gone. I don't once let go of the hold I have on Zack. The whole time, praying that he will just move. Chapter 35 Asher Maddox jumps the curb when we pull up to the apartment, his fender kissing the brick wall. I don't even take a second to make sure he's coming up with me. It's been too long. Chelsea's phone cut off two minutes ago, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about everything that could be happening to her. The sound of her scream is still echoing in my head, and the ball of dread starts to snowball out of control. When the elevator opens on our floor, my heart feels like it's stopped beating, because the second my feet hit the carpet outside the elevator, I hear the unmistakable sound of a gun being fired. Fucking hell, Maddox hisses. He's been keeping pace with me this whole time, the adrenaline clearly helping his movements. I run down the hall as quickly as I can, cursing that our door is the very last one on the hall, the one that will take me the longest to reach. Skidding to a stop at the open doorway, I see Sarah Jane. She's bound by her wrists and ankles with duct tape, and by the looks of it, either passed out or in shock. I can also see that she is the one bleeding from what appears to be two gunshot wounds, one to her left shoulder and the other to her right kneecap. I pull my own gun from my shoulder harness, looking over and seeing Maddox do the same. He nods his head towards the open doorway, and we make our way into the room, looking for any source of danger that might still be present. I stop dead in my tracks when we make it around the wall that was blocking the rest of the room from my view. Chelsea is clinging to a blonde woman, sobbing so hard that her whole body is shaking with the force of her crying. I look around the room, making sure there isn't another threat, before kneeling down next to them. The second my movements are registered with the blonde woman holding an inconsolable Chelsea, her head whips up, and all of a sudden I have a gun pointed against my forehead. Her eyes flash with recognition when she realizes who it is, and she immediately drops the gun. What the fuck, Emmy? Maddox booms through the room. Chelsea is shifted to my arms, and Emmy peels her body off the floor. For the first time, I notice that she has blood all over her. Are you hurt? I ask, my voice sounding miles away. It isn't mine. She wouldn't let me move her to check her wrists, but that's where it's coming from. She was cutting the tape off her wrists when I came in. Chelsea, sunshine, look at me. I'm here, I'm here, and it's over. Let me look at you. Her crying intensifies, and I look up at Emmy, helpless as to how to help her. She all but throws her piece at Maddox, who is still looking at her with so much anger that I'm shocked she isn't catching on fire. Then she kneels back on the floor next to Chelsea and slowly forces her hands off of her belly. Let me look at you, okay? Maddox is making the call right now, and we'll get you right over to the hospital to check on the baby. Is that what you're worried about? Her soothing voice whispers softly to Chelsea. I feel her nod her head yes against my chest and my heart drops. What if something is wrong with Zack? I didn't even think that he could be harmed. Her belly doesn't look injured. Chelsea, is it Zack? Sunshine, is it our boy? She nods her head, and I feel like I'm dying inside. Someone call fucking 911! God damn it! I roar. Maddox is calling them right now, Asher. Let me get closer so I can check her arms. I need to make sure the bleeding has stopped. Our boy, our perfect little baby boy. God wouldn't be so cruel. He wouldn't take Zack from us. He wouldn't allow another profound loss to rock our lives. He moved. She garbles against my chest. What was that, sunshine? What moved? She takes a deep breath, her whole body rocking with the movement. Zack, he finally moved. A sob escapes her mouth, 
and the sound of it is so intense that I have to close my eyes at the depth of her emotions. He finally moved when you talked. He wouldn't move, not until he heard you. She starts shaking again, her crying getting even stronger. I scan the room with wild eyes, looking for something, anything that can help me take her pain away. When I come up blank, I turn my attention back to her, rocking her slowly in my arms and pressing my forehead against hers. Emmy continues to check her wrists, holding a few towels that Maddox handed her against the deep wounds. When the room fills with cops and paramedics, I finally let some of the tension leave my body. Until I know that Chelsea and Zach are okay, I don't think I'll be able to release it all. Knowing that this could have ended differently is the only thing that is keeping me going right now. They're safe. And I'll never let her out of my sight now. Five hours later, we're sitting in her hospital room. She won't let me leave her side. Not that I have any plans to. So I lie with a good half of my body hanging off the edge of her narrow hospital bed. Our hands are laced together over her stomach and the sounds of our son's heartbeats are echoing around the room, a constant reminder for us that he is okay, safe within his mother's womb. She ended up needing numerous stitches along her arms and wrists from the damage the glass had done. They closed the cut on her eyebrow with glue since it wasn't as deep. They want to keep her overnight for observation, which I readily agreed to. Just being here is making things a little easier for us. Hearing the sounds of our son, alive and thriving, reaffirms that Chelsea kept him safe from danger. When I listened to her soft whispers telling the detectives what had happened, I had a hard time keeping it together. I want to find Sarah Jane and physically hurt her, watch her suffer like she made Chelsea. But when Chelsea grabs my hand, I quickly push the thoughts back. She wouldn't want me to be thinking that way. Sarah Jane needs help. Judging by her hysterical screaming when they finally were able to get her out of her comatose state, I would guess she's going to go straight to a mental hospital. I'm so proud of you, sunshine. She lifts her head, kissing my forehead before I could move back to look into her eyes. I was scared, baby, but I would have fought even longer. I will never let anything or anyone come between us. I lean in and press my lips softly to hers. She hums lightly in the back of her throat like she always does when I kiss her like this. I pull back and look at her in question. How are you dealing with all of this? Do you want to talk about it? Not really. I saw her, Ash. She wasn't right in the head, so if you're going to start blaming yourself, thinking because she was some chick in your past that you're responsible, then you can stop now. I look at her, slightly embarrassed that she has such a good read on me. I'm not sure that there will ever be enough help to make whatever is broken in her mind. She was talking nonsense. It's over, and I would really prefer to put it behind us. One thing I know for sure is I do not want to go back to that apartment. I can't, Asher. Even though I know there isn't danger anymore, I don't think I will ever feel safe there again. I understand. We'll get you out of here and stay at Coop's old house until we decide what we want to do. We don't need to make a decision now or even a month from now. All that matters is that you and Zach are going to be fine. I love you, I softly remind her, shifting slightly so I can bring her closer. It's hard to get her as close as I want to with the wires and probes and crap all over her stomach. I love you too, she murmurs, placing her head against my chest. We fall into a restless sleep after that. I wake up a few times when the nurses come in to check on her. But not once do I remove her body from my arms. Chapter 36, Chelsea Two weeks later Asher, I call from where I'm rocking. He surprised me with the mother of all nurseries, and I never want to leave it. When we decided to move into Coop's old house, it wasn't something we decided lightly. I was worried that it would be too hard for Asher to be in his old house. We had made amazing progress in cleaning it out, moving things that were trash and donating the others that didn't mean anything to Ash. All that was left were the items Ash wanted to keep. We decided that the first order of business was repainting the entire house. We spent hours painstakingly picking out each color for each room. Then we spent an even more obnoxious amount of time picking out the new furniture for the house. We got rid of everything that had been in my old apartment— 
since the majority of it was old stuff Dee had left behind, I didn't have many emotional attachments. We did keep all of Zack's nursery items, except this chair. It's a new addition. Designed to resemble the look of a baseball, it's white in color with red stitching that stands out beautifully. The creamy leather and softness of the plush cushions are enough to make me never want to leave this spot. It is heaven. Yeah? He shakes his head when he comes into the room and sees that I haven't left the seat, again, for the second day in a row. Sunshine, should I get you one of these in every room? Whatever he sees in my face has him throwing his head back and his rich laughter booming in the room. It's not going to happen, so get that thought out of your head. What time is everyone coming over tonight? We decided late last week that we wanted to have everyone over for dinner. It means a lot to us that we share this with our family. I've been so proud of Asher. After the successful takedown of Dominic, eight other major players in the nasty underworld of drugs, guns, and sex trafficking were apprehended that day. I know there are still times when Asher questions himself if he made the right call, but then I will see him look over at me, his eyes tracing a path from my face all the way to my very large belly. His eyes get all sexy and soft, and he just nods his head, coming to the conclusion without any help from me that he is, without a doubt, on the right path. His decision to give up his determination of being the one to take Dom out made it so that some major players in crime are now locked tight behind bars. We expect that Dominic's trial will take years. That's not really an issue for us, because there's no way he will ever live his life as a free man again, even if he were to have a trial tomorrow. There is just too much stacked against him. All because of Asher. I think they'll be here in about an hour. I wasn't sure about Maddox and Emmy— not sure what's going on with them right now, so I guess we will see. All right, baby. I lean my head and close my eyes, determined to sleep until the last second possible. I hear Asher laughing as he walks back down the hall to get the food ready for tonight. I smile and thank God for bringing that man into my life. Axel, Izzy, and baby Nate are the first ones to arrive. Izzy gives me a warm hug and we both laugh when our bellies smoosh together. Are you still grunting and groaning about having a daughter? I laugh, leaning over Nate to give Axel a hug. I wasn't. Woman, did you tell them I was complaining about my princess? Izzy bursts out laughing, her tiny belly bouncing with her mirth. Oh my god, you're already terrible. She isn't even here yet, and you're going all possessive over her. I tell you, Axel Reed, she is not going to like that when she gets older. He pulls himself up, towering over us all at six foot six, pulling Izzy to his side. He cups her under her arms and lifts her right off the ground as if she weighs nothing more than a feather. You listen to me, babe. My princess will never date. Ever. I'm considering going ahead at looking at homeschool. We need to get all those dicks away from my baby. Your baby? She mocks. You heard me. Just like her mom. She's mine. And I'm not letting some little prick get near my princess. He gives her a deep kiss before putting her back down. Incorrigible caveman, she says under her breath, earning her a light smack against her ass. Daddy, what's a prick? We all turn our heads sharply when we hear Cohen speak from behind Axel. He looks up at us with his wide smile, chubby cherub cheeks and his chocolate-colored eyes twinkling with wonder. He really is one of the coolest kids I've ever met. I've never seen him act up, and the things that come out of his mouth are hilarious. Can you guys make at least a small effort to remember there are little human ears around? Greg complains while carrying both of his daughters in their car seats into the house. Melissa follows close behind, a blinding smile across her face. She gives me a bone-crushing hug before following after Greg to help with their twins. Right when I'm about to close the door, I hear another car pull into the driveway. I smile when I see Dee and Beck. She is shaking her head and moving her mouth as if she's singing. But anyone who knows Dee knows that that's a terrifying thought. The girl can't hold a tune to save her life. Beck sits in the driver's seat, watching her with adoration shining bright. I shake my head and lean against the doorframe to wait her out. When the song finally ends, she jumps out of the car and runs towards me. Guess what? She screams. Uh, what? We started trying, she says with the biggest grin on her face. Awesome, Dee and Beck. I would say have fun. But we all know that would be a pointless thing to say. I've heard stories about you, John Beckett. He actually blushes at my jest. 
I laughed, throwing my head back and almost taking Asher's nose out in the process. I don't tell her everything, Dee defends. Ha, like he's going to believe you, wildcat. She smacks me in the arm before giving me a big hug. Beck gives me a one-armed squeeze. I never really understood the point of those. Who is missing? I call through the house, turning away from the door. Me, I hear rumbled behind me. I turn around so quickly that I almost fall on my ass. Maddox reaches out quickly and steadies me. Hey, Mad. I give him a big hug and kiss his rough cheek. Where is Em? I'm right here, she grinds out, her eyes never leaving Maddox's. Well, all righty then. I swear, you two, both of you need to wear bells. It's just not natural how quiet y'all prowl. Emmy looks over and flashes me a smile. We've grown real close since she saved my life. I feel like I owe her tremendously. How are you? she inquires. A lot better. I haven't had a nightmare since the bad one I had three days after it went down. I think I'm getting a lot better. Asher helps a lot, though. If I need to talk, he helps me get it all out and sort my head. I still have my moments, but for the first time in a long time, I don't feel alone. I'm really happy. It doesn't hurt knowing that crazy bitch is going to be locked up in that mental hospital for probably the rest of her life. They finally sentenced her? Maddox asks. As far as I know, I don't want to talk about the details with Asher. He let me know that she would be spending the rest of her life at a treatment center, and that's all I need to know. Apparently, she went batshit crazy, and no, that isn't the technical term they used. It's just a fact. I did ask him one thing, and really, it's the only thing I care about. I wanted to know why. Why she went so far off the rocker, she fell off the porch and down a hill where she landed in a pile of shit. They all laugh. I join in because really, now that it's over and done with, the only thing I can do is laugh. I don't want to remember the fear she had me drowning in. I see it every time I look at my wrists and see the scars that will probably always be there. Anyway, she got hooked on some hardcore drugs after Asher dumped her ass. Her father cut her off both physically and financially. She's been living off her seriously thick trust fund for the last eight years. The specifics and just how she was able to get to me still make my skin crawl. She had it planned for months, or as soon as she noticed how serious Asher was with me. Then when my stomach started growing, apparently that's when she snapped. They called it a psychotic break or something like that. To her, I was the other woman who had moved in on her man. I could laugh at Emmy's shocked expression. We all knew that it was bad. We just didn't realize it was this bad. She rented the apartment just a door down from ours. She would sit and watch our every move. The day that she knocked Joe unconscious and attacked me in our home was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. But I vowed to put it behind me. It's time for Asher and me to start moving forward and focusing on all the positive things in our lives. I just wanted to know what her motivation was. Now that I do, I can move on. You're one crazy strong woman, Chelsea, Emmy says, and I see so much respect in her eyes. I couldn't have done it without you, Em. You saved my life that day, mine and Zach's. She blushes an adorable blush that covers her face and neck. I'm just glad I had decided to stop by. I've been sitting on your baby gift for a few days, ever since I'd gotten back in town, and with everything going on, I'd forgotten to bring it to you. She shakes her head, and I reach out, hugging her tight. When I think about just how much her showing up was a huge tip of fate, how close I came to death that day, I still get sick. Just another reason for me to put it to rest and move on. Go on in and get comfortable. Asher has the food out on the grill now, so it shouldn't be long. She moves past me, and I don't miss the look of pure fire she shoots at Maddox when she slips through to the kitchen, where I hear Asher greet her with a loud yell. He's decided that Emmy is his honorary sister. I think it's adorable. He gets almost fatherly with his protection over Emmy. Which should be hilarious to watch if Maddox ever decides to make a move on her. Don't ask me about it, girl, he growls when I move my eyes from where Emmy disappeared to take him in. I don't know what you're talking about, I sweetly respond, batting my eyelashes in mock innocence. Sure you don't. How are you? And I mean, how are you really? None of that sugar-coated shit you've been handing out. Is there anything that doesn't get past you? I evade. I'm waiting. His tone leaves no room for argument. I sigh. I'm really good. I don't let what that woman did to me keep me from getting sleep at night. 
Do I have nightmares occasionally? You bet I do. Any normal person who went through that would. But Maddox, if there's one thing I've learned this past year, it's that life is way too short to sit back and dwell on things I have no control of. I'm alive. I've got a wedding to plan with a man who worships me with love, and our son will be here in just over a month. We all have bad days. The only thing that matters is whether you focus on those days, not the ones that are full of magic. I reach out and cup his rugged cheek. His whiskers tickle my palm and I laugh. One day, Maddox Locke, when you decide to let go of that pain inside you, you're going to understand what I mean. You have so much love to give in you. And for just a second, he lets all those walls he's built around him down. It's a fortress of protection so heavy that I'm not even sure many people have seen the real him. I gasp when I see the unadulterated pain that swims in those coal-like eyes. Yeah, sweetheart. Maybe you're right. We turn and walk into the house. Everyone is laughing and talking above each other. There is so much love in this house right now that I can't stop the huge smile from forming. Asher. Damn, she is beautiful. I can feel my cock tighten in my pants when I see that huge smile curve her lips. Her face is so open in this moment, the love and happiness clear to anyone who looks at her. You want me to wipe your drool there, Ash? I vaguely hear Axel harass. Maybe we should get him a bib, Greg booms with laughter. Leave him alone. I move my eyes off my gorgeous woman and whip my head sharply to Maddox. He just storms past me and out to the back deck. What the hell was that about? Beck asks. No clue. I know things have been tough since Maddox got home, with whatever happened between him and Emmy while they were gone, hanging around them in thick waves of emotion. It's only a matter of time before one of them explodes. Hey, baby. Chelsea breathes, sliding up to my side and curling her arms around me. Did you invite Sway and Davy? They haven't gotten here yet, so I wasn't sure if we should hold dinner for them. They can't make it, sunshine. Davy is taking Sway home to meet the folks this weekend. What? She gasps, excitement almost vibrating off of her. You heard me, babe. It looks like Davy is getting pretty serious. I'll tell you this much. If they get married before us, I will not be a happy man. She cocks her head to the side in the most adorable way and ponders my threat. Okay, let's go to the courthouse Monday. I'm free, you're free, let's do this. I study her, trying to determine if she's pulling my leg or not. You serious, Sunshine? Now, Asher Cooper, would I joke about something as serious as making you mine? I think you've got that a little mixed up, babe. I laugh, the sound roaring through the room. No, nope, you're going to be mine, and I'm going to love every second of it. It takes me a second to realize that the room has gone completely silent. I glance over her head and into the living room and see each one of our friends, no, our family, looking in on us, listening to our conversation with no shame at all. Well, it looks like we're getting married on Monday. I give her a deep kiss that is packed with all the desire I have for her. I used to live my life in the past. Stuck on a quest I was willing to die for. Trapped in a pit of darkness that I felt I would never leave. Until one incredible woman took a chance on me. Shined her light full of love and hope in on that darkness. And she saved me. She showed me how to live my life for a future I wanted. How to make peace with my pain. And how to embrace my happiness. And in two days, she's going to be my wife. Mine. Maddox. I walk past Chelsea while I choke down a lump the size of fucking Texas. I purposely sideswipe Emmy when I see her standing just behind us, her eyes full of tears. Fuck. It kills me to see her hurting. Fucking breaks me. I want nothing more than to pull her into my arms and promise her the world. But I keep walking. She deserves so much more than me, a broken man with nothing but the trail of pain behind him. I want to laugh when I remember Asher telling me about the darkness that was surrounding him. He acted like there was no way I could understand his situation. There's no doubt about it. He had a shit rot. Losing Coop cut us all deep. So I can only imagine that the slice he took losing his brother cut him to the core. 
and if he had darkness closing in on him, then I've been stuck in a black fucking hole. I know darkness. It's my best fucking friend. It's tainted every inch of my soul. And that's why I'm terrified to let Emmy in, to risk my angel becoming tainted with the shit that swirls around me. She's pureness. She's the definition of everything I don't deserve. I snag a beer out of the fridge and go sit in the living room, silent as always, listening to all of the people I care about laugh and love. Meanwhile, I keep my mouth shut, afraid that if I let my guard down, if I let them in, I will destroy them all. I hear Asher announce from where he's standing in the kitchen that he and Chelsea will be getting married this week. Good for them. Chelsea looks at me and gives me a wink. I shake my head and look away right into the steaming mad eyes of Emerson Rose Keys. I hold her gaze and wait to see what she will do next. You're fucking unbelievable, she mumbles, almost low enough that I don't catch it. And like the idiot I am, I egg her on. What was that, Em? Her eyes flash, her porcelain skin turns pink, and she jumps up from where she was sitting at the kitchen table. The chair falls to the floor in a loud clatter that draws the attention of the room. Fucking great. She storms over to me, grabs my beer from my hand, and takes a large pull before handing it back to me. Look at you, sitting there silent as always. You're in a room full of people who love each other, people who have fought their demons in order to be together. They had the strength to battle anything that stood in their way, the courage to push away from uncertainty of the unknown. And what does Maddox Locke do? He sits back and gives everyone else around him advice on how to make that happen. He fights for them, but he refuses to fight for himself, for me. Well, guess what, buddy? I'm sick of it. I love you for you. I never gave a damn about your past, those secrets you hide so deep. I've been willing to fight for you, battle those demons that shake your doors at night. And while I'm at it, I might as well just go for broke, right? She laughs, and it sounds so empty. I never gave a damn about you having one leg. You think you're slick hiding it, but I see you. I didn't love you for whatever limbs you have or don't have. I want you for your heart, and I won't settle for anything less. She stomps over to Asher and Chelsea, gives them a hug, and apologizes for ruining their night, to which, of course, they assure her that she didn't. The whole time she's talking to them, Asher is throwing silent daggers at me with his eyes. I'm left there, my jaw slack, and a million doubts running through my mind. And for the first time in too many years, that small flame of hope starts to flicker. Epilogue. Chelsea. Ugh, I feel terrible. My back has been killing me all day. Of course, it doesn't help that I went crazy pregnant woman and cleaned every inch of the house I could reach yesterday. My due date has come and gone. I'm so beyond ready to meet our baby that my anxiety is making me crazy. Asher's just as bad. He's been calling me every hour on the hour for the last three days. Ever since I passed my due date, it would seem that I transferred over my basket case persona to him. And it is driving me nuts. So here I am on this perfectly sunny day, surprising my husband with lunch at work. He hasn't been terribly busy lately, just going in for a few hours a day. With him and Maddox working the computers and technical team at core security, they've been able to ease the workload considerably. I pull myself out of my brand new Audi, a wedding present from Asher, and hike up my pants in a move that I'm sure is sexy as hell. I pull the edges of my shirt to make sure it's covering my stomach before I reach in the car and grab the bag of lunch I picked up from Asher's favorite Mexican restaurant. The smell of it has almost caused me to wreck the damn car a few times on the way over. After making sure I have everything, I waddle over to the sidewalk, my flip-flop slapping loudly against the pavement. Seeing sway in the window has me lifting my arm and waving wildly. The second I go to put my arm down, I feel this tremendous pain in my stomach. Sway cocks his head at me, clearly puzzled with my actions. I look down from his eyes and try to figure out what just happened. Sway bursts through the door to his salon about the same time that I realize that my water just broke— of all places to have my water break, it's a damn golden sidewalk. I love this sidewalk. Now all I'm going to think about is my pregnancy water leaking out of my vagina. Sway! My vagina broke the happiness! I cry when he runs over. He grabs the food and my purse before helping me walk the few steps left to take me inside core security. Sway! I pant. Are you listening to me? 
My vagina broke it! Of course, that would be the moment that we stepped through the door to see us. And of course, the lobby wouldn't be empty. Hey, baby! I gasp. I grab my tight stomach when a new wave of pain washes over me. Holy shit, this hurts! Sunshine, are you okay? No, I'm not okay. I brought you Mexican, and my vagina broke the happiness. Do I look okay? I have to take a huge gulp of air when I feel another sharp pain rock through my stomach. They aren't supposed to be coming this fast, baby! I whine. His eyes widen when the meaning behind my words becomes clear. He smiles for a second before I whimper when my stomach starts to tighten again. Davy, sugar pie, I think you need to get those sexy fingers of yours dancing over to the phone. It looks like there's a baby on the way. That snaps Asher into motion. He tosses the file he was looking at over to Davy, rushing over to my side and helping Sway move me deeper into the lobby. We're just about to pass the reception desk when I let out a brutal scream and my body goes limp. Let's lay her down here. All right, darling, Sway asks, calm as can be. I look into Asher's eyes and see the fear leering behind his excitement. I try to reassure him that I'm okay, that this is normal, but when I open my mouth, the only thing that comes out is a scream. Dill, baby, Davy calls from where he is standing, talking to what I assume is a 911 operator. Go ahead, doll. You just tell me what I need to do, Sway calls over his shoulder. I can hear Davy responding to him, but I'm lost to the pain that is ripping through my body. I keep my eyes glued to Asher's. He strokes my face, kissing my hand when it clamps down on his own, and between the contractions that are killing me, he presses his forehead against mine and whispers how much he loves me. I feel movement, and then cold air hits my legs. I keep my eyes on Ash, my breathing controlled, and my hand clamped in his. When I feel someone take my other hand in theirs, I break my connection to Asher and look over at Maddox's grim face. He gives me a weak smile and a small squeeze. I feel another contraction starting, so I whip my head back to Asher and grunt through the pain. Don't you dare look any lower than her face, Asher warns Maddox. I would laugh if I didn't feel like I was being sawed in half. I vaguely feel my panties being removed and my eyes widen in shock. It's okay, sunshine. Let Sway do what they tell him to. We need to check and see if you're crowning. Jesus, I can't believe this is happening here. His eyes show his vulnerability in the moment, and I don't have time to analyze his words, because just on the heels of the last one, another powerful pain takes my abdomen prisoner. I scream when it becomes too much. Uh, Asher? He looks down when Sway calls his name and his eyes widen so large that I briefly wonder if they will pop out. He looks back at me, his eyes showing his worry. You need to push now. I'm right here and everything's going to be okay. I promise you that. I gulp and take a deep breath, remembering from the classes we took what I should be doing. It takes more effort than I ever thought was possible. I scream, curse, and beg. It takes ten long minutes, my body starting to take the toll of the effort I'm using to push our son out to give him life. I just finished another push that makes me feel like my head is about to blow off my body. The pain felt different, more intense than what had been seizing my insides. I gave another push, my energy starting to drain quickly. No more! Stop! Oh, God! I stop immediately when Sway screams over my groaning. My body is demanding that I push, but I hold back, praying that this will be over soon. Asher's face has a look of complete euphoria. He's looking down past my stomach. The tears that are falling from his eyes in rapid succession make me fear that something could be wrong. Chelsea, give me one more small push. I bear down and do as Sway says. The emptiness that follows terrifies me for a second. And then I hear it. The most powerful lungs I've ever heard pierce through the room. Asher leans down, his forehead once again hitting mine. Our tears dance together. I hear the EMT rush into the room, but I don't move. They call out orders, and Asher leans up. I look down and see Sway still kneeling between my spread legs. He's holding a small bundle wrapped in what I recognize as Asher's shirt. He hands him over to the man waiting to make sure he's okay, and looks up to meet my eyes. I've never seen Sway this overcome with emotion. His tears are falling just as fast as ours are. He's beautiful, he croaks. He moves out of the way and lets the professionals do their jobs. It takes a few minutes before I watch as one of the men walk around and hand the small bundle, 
now wrapped in a clean blanket, to Asher. He lets out a breath, tracing our son's round cheek with his finger. I silently soak up this moment between father and son. My body heaves with the effort to keep my sobs in. I observe in awe as Asher brings our tiny son's face close and gently lowers his forehead to Zack's. I love him so much, little brother, he whispers. I watch through my clouded tears as Asher gives Zack a kiss on the top of his head, looks over to the far wall, and smiles sadly before he leans down and hands me our son. When I look at his tiny face for the first time... I feel a love so powerful that it's like my heart just jump-started to full throttle. He's perfect, I gasp. His fuzzy head of hair, plump, tiny lips and round cheeks, all features that mirror his father. He looks just like Coop, and I can't help but smile at the thought. Full circle, brother. I forget that Maddox is there until he spoke. It takes me a second to understand... But then I remember Asher's earlier comment. I lean forward slightly and peer over Maddox's shoulder to see the portrait of Coop hanging proudly. His smiling face looks down on us, showering us with the happiness he always carried. And that's when it hits me, the enormity of what Maddox just spoke. We lost Coop in this very spot not even a year ago, and here we are now. Coop's son being born right where he was lost to us forever. Full circle, I murmur, stroking Zack's cheek. Later that night, with the room full of our family, we finally tell them Zack's full name. There isn't a single person who isn't crying after that. I just know that when Zack grows up, he will be a man strong enough to carry his name. Zachariah Asher Cooper our perfect son, and the proof that there really is a higher power at play. There is no doubt in my mind that Coop was with us today, that he watched over as his son was born and his brother became a father. Life coming full circle. Bonus scene. Yoga time. Jesus Christ, I look humongous in everything, I mutter, throwing another pair of my jeans over my shoulder. I've been standing in the middle of my bedroom for the last twenty minutes, trying to decide what I would wear tonight for girls' night out. It's been five months since Zack was born, and even though I'm back to my pre-pregnancy size, I still feel like everything looks too tight on me. Sunshine, you want me to tell you why it looks like every piece of clothing you own is now all over the room? Asher laughed from the doorway. Turning my head sharply, I gave him the meanest look I can, which quickly dies when I see him holding our son. I never thought he could get more attractive, but with him holding our sleeping son to his chest, he tops the scale of hot. Asher Cooper is a man who could melt your panties clear off your body on a normal day. He's six foot four with a body that isn't too bulky, but just the right amount of muscles to make him look like a god. His dark blonde hair has grown even more over the last few months, and I love how it constantly falls over his forehead. The ends curl at his neck in that slightly overgrown, sexy way. Fully clothed, he would have me begging for him to take me. But now he's walking around the house in just a pair of sweats, hanging low on his hips. And nothing else? Yeah, I pretty much melt into a puddle of desire. Swallow your tongue, babe, he laughs. I stick my tongue out and decide that ignoring him is a better route here. He laughs again, and I hear him leave the doorway. Turning my attention back at the few clothes I have left to try on... I huff a breath and pick up the closest pair of pants. By the time Asher comes back to the bedroom, I have thrown two more pairs of jeans, a pair of capris, and a pair of black pants over my shoulder. I'm in the middle of pulling the pair of yoga pants up my legs when I hear him walk back into the bedroom. He pauses in his tracks, and I hear him groan. Smiling to myself at the view I must be giving him, I start to pull the pants past my knees slowly. One thing about Asher... He will never complain about the extra curves I've developed from having Zack. I might have lost all the weight, but now my hips flare out more and my thighs are a little fuller. And then, of course, there are my breasts, which decided to stay two sizes bigger since I'm still breastfeeding Zack. Right when I'm about to pull the waistband of my yoga pants over the curve of my ass, I feel Asher close the distance between us. He bats my hands away and gives my ass a caress before he swats me lightly. 
Damn, Chelsea. I swear you're trying to kill me right now. I'm just getting dressed, Ash. I laugh. Uh, no, you're definitely not just getting dressed. You're wearing those pants you had on last week, and I told you if I saw you wearing these again, I would show you just what they do to me. You're crazy. These things make me look huge. I swat his hands and move to walk away. I should have expected it, but I was more focused on getting to the closet and slipping a shirt over my sports bra. No way I was doing my daily yoga without a shirt since Asher is home today. Sunshine, get back here, he growls. No, thank you, honey. I'm off to the basement to work out. No time to chat. No time at all. I'm not joking, Chelsea. Only an hour tops until Zack is ready for lunch. We can chat later. You have three seconds to get that fine ass over here before I come get you, he threatens. Shit. I know what that means. I swear he can see right through me. Turning around slowly, I straighten my back and take a deep breath of strength. We have had this argument almost weekly since I had Zack. Yes, my lovely husband. What can I do for you this fine afternoon? I smart. Don't give me that shit, babe. I see what you're doing. You're in here beating yourself up again. How many times do I have to tell you that you're beautiful? Those curves you hate so much are curves you got while our boy grew in your body. I fucking love those curves. I sigh. I know, Ash. You tell me that all the time, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to see this body how you do. Yeah? Well, tell me just how you do see that body. His voice has a harsh edge to it now, and if I were wise, I probably would pay more attention to it. But since I'm in the middle of body image meltdown, I don't even pay it an ounce of attention. Okay, we can play this game. When I look in the mirror now, I see every little pinch of extra skin. I see my tits that don't sit firm and full unless they're about to explode with milk. I see my ass that doesn't sit quite as high as it used to. My stomach might be flat, but it damn sure isn't firm. Let's not even get started on my hips that seem to have expanded a few sizes, and my thighs that are starting to dimple. I end my rant on a scream huff out of breath, and finally look up to meet his eyes. His blue orbs are blazing bright. His full lips are parted in a shocked O. Oh. I can tell that he's holding on to his control by just a thread. Where are you going right now? He questions, throwing me off with his change of subject. Ha, huh, I knew he wouldn't even touch that minefield. No man would be stupid enough to reply to all that shit I just threw out. Ah, uh, to do my yoga in the basement? He gives me a sharp nod prowls towards me and bends to hook his shoulder into my belly. Oh my god, Asher, what are you doing? I shriek. Quiet, wife, he demands, slapping my ass hard enough to sting. I'm going to fucking show you just how wrong you are. Fucking hell, woman. He stomps through the house, grabbing Zack's monitor off the kitchen table, before trotting down the stairs into the basement. The whole time he's muttering about what a crazy person his wife is and how he clearly needs to take me to the eye doctor. I just snort and hang on for the ride, He'll see. He hasn't been able to get me naked without the lights off or dim in months. So once he sees exactly what I'm talking about, he'll understand, and I'm going to laugh in his cocky face. He gently puts me down on my feet, turning to power up the iPod. I can hear the beat of Kelly Rowland's motivation start to fill the room. He stands there with his legs braced, his back tight, and his thick arms crossed over his chest. His face is impassive, and I start to squirm in his silence. Go ahead. You wanted to do your yoga, so do it. My mouth opens and closes a few times at his demand. I... I can't just... You can't expect me to... Damn it, Asher! You've got it in your head that you need to change this body that I fucking love, so, woman, get to changing. His face doesn't change. If anything, he gets an even harder expression. Well, shit. I hear the music change into something a little easier for me to relax to deciding it's best to just ignore him and start my warm-up and stretches. After fifteen minutes of stretching, bending, and swinging my body enough to wake up my tired muscles, I turn and see him still in the same position. Well, whatever. Completely lost in my yoga, I forget that Asher's in the room. I enjoy the way my body starts to wake up, feeling the endorphins start to shoot through my body. My skin starts to feel alive. Every part of my body is awake and loving the feeling of being used— I've just bent down to place my palms against the mat when I hear him growl. I jump and look through my spread legs at the man standing behind me. Gone is a pissed-off impassiveness. Gone are the hard lines of his anger. His arms are no longer crossed over his chest. 
Instead, I find him standing a few feet behind me. His shorts are gone, his hard cock being stroked lazily in one fist. What the hell? When I move to stand, he quickly moves forward and firmly grasps my hips. His rock-hard cock, free of his hold, slides forward between my spread legs. I moan at the feeling. He rocks his hips forward a few times, causing us both to breathe a little heavier. Does this feel like I don't love every goddamn thing about your body, Chelsea? Hmm? Because let me tell you, sunshine. I see your body and I want to throw you over my shoulder every damn time. I see your tits and I want to take them in my hands. I want to watch your pink nipples harden at my touch right before I suck them deep in my mouth. I see the stomach you say isn't firm enough and honestly, I could care less, babe. I see your stomach and I remember how hot you looked carrying our boy. Then I can't help but get hot thinking about putting another baby in there. And that ass, Jesus Christ. You don't even want to know how many times I've had to go to the bathroom at work because I'll picture that fine ass and all of a sudden my cock is begging for release. I see those thighs you say are getting dimples, and all I can think about is getting my hands on them, spreading your legs and digging my fingers in while I devour that sweet pussy with my tongue. He flexes his fingers against my skin, rubs his hard cock against the seam of my pants, and groans loud and long. Sunshine, this body that you think isn't perfect would kill me if it got any better. Stop beating yourself up, okay? You start questioning just how much I want this perfect body— then I have no issues with reminding you just how much I crave it. He finishes his statement and drops to his knees. His legs go between my still-spread ones, his cock bobbing against his stomach, his face nuzzling right against my aching pussy. Oh, God, I pant. His deft fingers grab the waistband of my pants and bring them along with my panties down as far as they will go. He doesn't even pause. His fingers clamp onto my hips and he pulls me against his face. With the height difference, I have to come up on my toes and brace my arms as far as I can. His cock is just inches from my lips, and I know that if I drop my arms slightly, I can take him deep. Taking one hand off the mat, I grasp him firmly in my hand. He growls against my pussy, the vibrations causing me to clench deep within. It's not going to take long for me to come, and I want him right there with me. Since I can only use one hand without falling... I wrap my fingers tightly and bring my lips down to suck him as deep as I can take him. His swollen head hits the back of my throat and I relax, breathe through my nose and take his hard length even deeper. He pulls his mouth off my drenched pussy and spits out, Fuck me! The sound echoes through the room. My victory of gaining the upper hand is short-lived. One firm palm comes down hard on my ass cheek and he digs his fingers in deep. With his hand full of my ass, his other hand still helping holding me up, and his mouth back against my swollen lips, he gives me everything he has. He doesn't just lick and suck. He devours my pussy with a fierceness I've never known him capable of. I feel it across every inch of my skin and deep within my body. And I know I'm going to come harder than I've ever come before. I double my efforts at making him come, my head starting to rush from being upside down so long as only adding to the fire his lips and tongue are creating. I moan against his cock, feeling him twitch in my mouth. Taking my hand off his hard shaft, I grab his balls lightly and play with them for a few seconds. Using my tongue, I lick around his head, pressing against the vein in his shaft and nipping lightly with my teeth. Trusting that he has my balance under control, I bring my other hand off the floor, his hand moves from playing with my ass to hold on to the other side of my hips. Giving him everything I have, I suck and lick until I feel his balls and my right hand start to pull tight. His shaft grows even harder, and I give him hard suck before his cum is shooting deep down my throat. And right when I swallow the last drop, I feel his teeth clamp down on my clit and his mouth gave the most delicious suction. I come so hard that my knees buckle and I scream his name. My hands, which have now fallen to his muscular thighs, dig in and ride each wave. His tongue continues to lick my wetness from my pussy and thighs. His hungry groans and my panting are the only things that can be heard over the music still playing in the background. When he finishes, he helps me stand and turns me to face him. My pants falling to my ankles mid-spin causes me to fall forward into his chest. Don't ever doubt that I love this fucking body, Chelsea. 
Not that I don't mind proving you wrong, but it pisses me off that he just can't see how beautiful you are. I nod. My mind snuck in a fog when the orgasm's still hanging close. He shakes his head and laughs lightly. Still don't believe me? He questions with a wicked gleam in his eyes. Oh, hell. I could use some more convincing, I whisper. And just like that, I find myself back over his shoulder, his long legs making the trek back up the stairs and into our bedroom, where he spends the rest of our son's nap time proving to me just how much he loves my body. This concludes Cooper by Harper Sloan. Narrated by Sean Crisden and Abby Creighton. Copyright 2014 by E.S. Harper. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Harper Sloan and was produced in the year 2014 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers, or call toll free 877 7 Tantor to request a catalog.